June 11th select board meeting. The meeting is called to order at 6.31 p.m. We are finally back at town hall after a, a, a nice hiatus after town meeting uh, and having been at the middle school for a couple of weeks before that. So we are back to a regular select board <coughs> meeting that starts off regularly with public comment, except that this week we have a different way of starting. Um, we have uh, Deborah Radway, the new human resources director here, and the town manager would like to introduce her to the town of Amherst. Sure, and uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to uh, introduce Deb Radway to you uh, in person and to the wider community uh, by telecast of this meeting. Deb is our uh, newly appointed human resources director. She'll be starting work uh, in the town of Amherst on July 16th, and I wanted to have the opportunity for her to meet you uh, tonight uh, in your packet, as well as posted in the meeting packet online on the town website. Uh, you have my press release that I, I issued last week announcing this appointment uh, and we've also attached to that uh, Ms. Radway's uh, resume. Uh, Deb uh, Radway brings 23 years of experience in both the public and private sector, uh, uh, pointed at, hu at human resources, uh, including 14 years in the public sector uh, in uh, human resources and senior uh, general government uh, management positions. Uh, since 2005, she's worked for the Mass Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development, managing the Franklin Hampshire Career Center. And uh, back in the day, she was town administrator in the neighboring town of Montague and has also served as assistant town manager, uh, personnel director in Lexington, Mass. Uh, I'm really pleased with the appointment um, it really is a combination of uh, in-depth human resources uh, experience uh, that she brings to the table uh, that will benefit uh, all of our uh, employees as well as the, uh, the management of the town uh, and the fact that she has senior management experience uh, in, in state government as well as local government uh, will uh, allow her, I think, to be an immediate uh, uh, contributor, uh, substantial contributor to uh, all of the kind of big picture uh, issues facing the town that, that we grapple with. So I'm really pleased that Deb has accepted uh, my offer to come join us uh, in service to the town and wanted uh, Deb to take this opportunity if she so chose to uh, introduce herself or say a few words. And if you do, you'd like to come up to the table so the uh, mic can pick you up for folks at home. Welcome. Good evening, and it's my pleasure to be here. I'm very, very, very excited um, <clears throat> to be joining uh, John's leadership team, and I hope to be bringing um, energy and um, a great work ethic and a wide array of human resources skills, along with my background in local government. Um, to the town and can't wait to get started. It's going to be a long month between now and when I do. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming in to and meet us this evening and to uh, to meet the public this way. This is a this is a really exciting time in Amherst, and I think that this is just a tremendous time to become part of a, a very strong team that Ms. Musanti has put together. So, uh, thank you very much and uh, and welcome. We're very excited to have you get started next month, July sixteenth. Is that correct? Yes. Terrific. Exactly. And uh, also thanks to the uh, search committee that uh, that helped to, to vet the many excellent candidates that you received for this job posting. And let, let me just publicly acknowledge the members of my screening panel, which included Human Rights Commission Chair Reynolds Winslow, uh, Conservation and Development Director Dave Zomek, uh, personnel board representative, but probably better known to the community as retired police chief Charlie Sherpa, uh, uh, Northampton Human Resources Director uh, Glenda Stoddard, and our uh, interim HR director and also our benefits uh, uh, manager, uh, Kays Logar, also assisted. I thank you for reminding me to say something about that, but they did a nice, nice work. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Ms. Radway from the select board? Welcome. 
Thank Welcome. you very much. Yes, so, Ms. Brewer. So if you saw, I don't know if you heard about the cheat sheet, but it's my understanding <laughs> that you're willing to go, that you're willing to go by Deb for our benefit because we have a variety of Debs and Debras and Debbies, so. I, I did observe that he has managed to master Twitter and now he's going 3D. <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very nice. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so for, for folks who don't interact with the, the third floor as much as we do, this will now be the third Deborah on that floor. So uh, we're, we're in serious nickname adoption mode. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Thank I look forward much. to seeing you next month. Thanks. All right. So there is no one here for public comment this evening. So uh, we will do a couple of untimed items before we get to our first timed item. Uh, let's see. We'll start with the easy stuff. We've got a couple of special liquor licenses. Ms. Stein, would you like to make that motion? I move that the select board approve town special oil alcohol licenses, licenses for Meredith Schmidt on behalf of Top of the Campus Incorporated for receptions to be held from 5 to 11 p.m. Tuesday, June 12, 2012 on the Goodell Library lawn and Wednesday, June 13, 2012 in the Berkshire Dining Hall, both on the University of, of Massachusetts Amherst campus. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Next up, uh, taxi license. I move that the select board approve a new taxi driver slash chauffeur license for Colin Baker on behalf of Ambassador Taxi. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> That's unanimous. Uh, let's see. How about minutes? Did folks have a chance to look at the minutes from May 7th that were in our packet? Uh, I didn't have minutes in my packet. Oh, no. Oh. Okay, maybe they were just online. Um, okay. We should I oh. have? We can wait until next month. I, I did not. Uh, have next month. No, next week. But I wasn't going to admit that out loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. We'll do those next week. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see other things that are untimed that we can take care of. Uh, we can do committee appointments. Okay, um, new committee appointments. I move that the select board appoint Brian Harvey as the citizen representative to the audit committee for a term to expire June 30th, 2013. Second. For the discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. I move that the select board appoint Mul Walter Mullen to the La Paz Nicaragua Sister City Committee, Jennifer Lind and Renee Thurberge. I'm not sure if that's probably a record of wretched pronunciation <laughs> to the Public Arts Commission. Richard Fine and uh, William Mullen to the Public Works Committee and Susan Lowenstein as a registrar of voters, all with terms to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Um, this one got slightly changed. I hope my note is correct. On this, I thought we were getting a new motion sheet, but it doesn't, it probably wasn't worth it. I move that the select board, these are reappointments, committee reappointments. I move that the select board appoint uh, Jana McClure to the Community Development Committee, Ellen Cosmer, Michael um, Jakes, and Paris. Um, Paris Boyce, the latter serving as the Conservation Commission representative to the Community Preservation Act Committee. The other two are also to that committee. Denise Barbarette and um, Catherine Warwick Feldman to the Hampshire Regional Emergency Planning Committee. Lois Raj, Kathleen Anderson, and Reynolds Winslow to the Human Rights Commission. Aaron Croft to the Kanagasaki Sisters City Committee, 
Kathleen Mullen to the La Paz, Nicaragua Sister City Committee, D. Anthony Butterfield to the Personnel Board, Charles Moran to the Public Works Committee, Michael Jakes, Barry Roberts, and Leslie Ariola to the Town slash Commercial Relations Committee, all with terms to expire June 30th, 2015. Second. For the discussion, Mr. Hayden, and then Ms. Burke. I'd like to welcome all of those folks back again. I appreciate coming to work with us. Thank you very much. Ms. Brewer. Um, a couple of, of corrections. One is we had changed, and it hasn't followed through on all the paperwork yet, but it's Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee, not Community Development Committee anymore. But we all know that, but, you know, for the purposes of the motion and future records. It's also listed. We do have this really nice sheet for anybody who wants to look online that has everybody's, um, and they are the same basic thing, but the name has changed. Also, for clarification purposes, as uh, Ms. Stein pointed out, with Paris serving as the CONCOM rep, perhaps it just helps to put, you know, CONCOM in parentheses and then at large in parentheses behind Ellen Cosmer and Michael Jakes because that's the only group that has a variation, whereas the rest are all just members. Mm -hmm. But uh, Paris was designated by CONCOM, whereas the other two are specifically at-large members. Good suggestions. All right, uh, further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. And yes, thank you to all those folks for their willingness to be reappointed, and thank you to Ms. Stein and Ms. Brewer for, uh, for their work on getting these things processed. There will be more next week, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, let's see. 6.43, you got a couple more minutes. Audit committee charge? Do we want to change yeah, you want to do the audit committee, committee charge, charge revision? Okay. That's pretty simple. Sure, if I can find it. <laughs> so we have a document in our yes. packets that has the, uh, has the wording of the charge, and it's really just a, a pretty technical revision that we're making, so. I move that the select board amend the charge of the audit committee to identify that representatives from the select board, school committee, library trustees, and finance committee will be desi designated by vote of their members to identify that the member of the public is to be appointed by the select board, actually has just been, and to change the title of the town accountant to controller. Is there a second? Second. Second. Further discussion. So this is uh, this is just clarifying and, and making more specific what had already been the practice within the charge, but just making sure that that is all uh, <clears throat> codified. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. All right. It is 6:44, which is the same as 6:45, as Mr. Wells will <laughs> give me. The hassle about, uh, so our 645 item is to uh, consider and vote proposal to increase senior tax work off program <coughs> slots. We have Mr. Pooler here to talk to us about this. Um, the last time we dealt with the, the senior tax work off program was in August of 2010 when we changed the amount that folks were making per hour and changed the, uh, the full amount that was available. At that time we talked about um, whether or not there was enough uh, room in the program to accommodate all the folks who wanted to do it. And at that time, we specifically, I look back on my notes from that meeting, we specifically told uh, Mr. then Mr. Musanti and Miss um, Plant from the Senior Center to let us know if there were more people who wanted to participate than could be accommodated. So uh, as luck would have it, here we go. So Mr. Pooler. Yes, I'm here to say there are more people who want to participate than can be accommodated. <laughs> Um, and uh, Ms. Plant, uh, t the town assessor, Mr. Burgess, and I uh, recommend that we increase the number of slots from 30 to 35. Um, people can earn up to $1,000 of credit toward their taxes if they work the full 125 uh, hours during the year. Not everybody does work that those full number of hours, so we think we have extra capacity to take on more people and still stay within the $30,000 target uh, for the cost of this um, program. So um, the program's been going well. Um, obviously there's interest out there and uh, we'd like to try to serve those people and, and we think we can do so staying within our budgeted targets. 
That's great. Um, I think that that has changed since the last discussion because I think that um, Ms. Plant was saying the last time that most people were working beyond the hours that were um, that that they were able to get the tax work off credit for. So I mean, which is normal. There can be shifts in. And there are people who, in fact, volunteer more time than yeah. they, they get credited for. But there is a limit in the law for how many hours you can get credit, and then some of them just go on and volunteer for us. Right. But so some of them aren't fulfilling the whole limit, which is why there is still room is for us to add people, even at the same cap level. So, exactly so that's right. interesting. Oh, it's great that uh, it's great that you're able to track that so well, so that we know that we can add people without it changing the cost at all. Questions and comments, Ms. Brewer. In terms of the cost target, what is the um, when we? I know it's thirty thousand, but when we get close to that, I mean, it's referred to here as a cost target in terms of you know if we start bumping up against that because more people are actually wanting to do the hours, then what happens at that point? Is there a way to come back to the select board before we have to before they have to stop, or is it one of those things where you know like ginormous financial aid offices where they just say you're done, kind of thing? So uh, you know, what's our process if were such a thing to occur? Um, I, I think that uh, people, will, when they're in the program, they, the 30,000 is a target. It's not a, a budgeted number. So they will be able to fulfill their, their programs. Excellent. And then we'll just get an update on how much it actually was exactly. once it actually happens. Exactly, exactly what I was looking for. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Right. Other questions or comments about the program or the change? <clears throat> Ms. Stein, and then Mr. Hayden. Just noting that it's 125 hours, and because there's, there are two figures, and one of them is correct, one is not, and it's the 125 that is correct. In, in the backup material, there was a, a description of the program that said that the limit was um, 100 hours. The cover memo says 125, and that is correct. Just time pointed that out, and you were right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Hayden. I, I was just going to be appreciative for that. I mean, it's very brief, but a very, yeah, very useful memo. We could figure all of this out pretty quickly, given this. Yeah, the, the, there was that little conflict, but I, it's resolved now. So. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments about senior tax work off program changes? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Sure. I move that the select board amend the program rules for senior citizens' property tax abatements under MGL Chapter 59, Section 5K by increasing the number of eligible volunteers from 30 to 35. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for coming in. Good night. All right. Unfortunately, I did not time this too well tonight, so we still have six minutes. Um, so let's talk about uh, reviewing liaison representative assignments. Um, this is on there specifically because we were dealing with a couple of things that had to do with the audit committee. Um, and so it seemed like a good opportunity for us to determine who our audit committee representative would be. Um, Ms. Stein has been it, and I'm not sure if you're just willing to give it up if somebody else wants it or you want to give it up. Um. I'd be happy to give it up, but if nobody else takes it, I will stay on. Okay. How's that? Sounds good. Anyone interested in serving on the audit committee? What does that entail exactly? It basically is one day of meetings, if I remember correctly, where um, the auditors go through um, their findings, which more have to do with process um, than they do uh, checking if we're spending too much in a certain account. I think that's the best way I can summarize it. Is that about right, John? Yeah, it's, it, for the past several years, it's been one meeting per year. You'll get a copy of the audit and the management letter in advance of that meeting. You need to look that over, and then it's a presentation from our independent auditor and Q&A, and also discussing a work plan for the subsequent year's audit. So from the select board perspective, it basically equals one, one meeting. meeting as liaison assignments go not too bad <laughs> yes exactly uh, so is anyone interested in it or shall we leave it with miss stein i'm interested in diana keeping it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, i like that, yeah, that all makes right since no one's timing. jumping for it are you willing to yes, keep it okay thank you so then with the rest of our assignments we don't really need to go through them one by one and uh 
um, we, we do just kind of look at this every year so that people have the opportunity to get rid of anything that's mm -hmm. not fitting into their schedules or to pick up something that they have a particular interest in. So uh, are there particular things that folks would like to change for any reason or would they like to keep them how they are, Ms. Brewer? I would really like um, someone else to see if they could consider doing DAAC. It, it's a difficult one to do from the standpoint that it's at 11 or 11.30 in the morning, typically on a Tuesday, which kind of breaks up your whole day in terms of you are at work normally during that time. One of the things that gives me confidence about not having a select board liaison there is the fact that Nate Malloy is also liaison to so many staff is so is liaison to so many other things that DAAC interacts with that I know he keeps that up plus former select board member Jerry Weiss is a member of DAAC so and as we know he sends us emails every so often about that so I don't feel horrible about not having a select board representative available to them regularly and I am occasionally able to show up but if anyone has a particular interest in that please let us know and I'm sure they'd be thrilled to have someone there more often and yeah, nobody's jumping for DAAC. So, <laughs> Similarly, you know, adding another thing is hard. It, it is. It's very difficult. Um, the um, which one am I liaison to that? I can never get to Amherst Housing Authority meets on Mondays before this meeting. That's just not a good time it's for me to be able to. It's usually at four o'clock. Even though their meetings are very quick and efficient, um, it's very hard to get to. So, if anyone thinks they could get there more than I can get there, which it would be hard to get there less than I get there. Um, <laughs> you're welcome to take that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, nobody interested in <laughs> grabbing any. Okay, anybody else want to want to offer out there any things they can't do? Or all right. So another thing that that's always possible, not as an obligation, but um, it's something that we do with a budget coordinating group. And I know that we used to uh, joint capital planning committee sometimes was. Uh, if it was a particularly important meeting uh, that we thought somebody should attend and we couldn't personally attend, we could kind of put out a call to select board members and say, hey, you know, do you think somebody could be there? So we should keep that in mind also. All right. So we're just going to, by consensus, essentially keep everything that we have currently. Good enough. All right. Next. So it's... 654, which is the same as 655. So we will move on to our poll hearing. At 655, we have a joint poll hearing, jointly owned polls between Western Mass Electric and Verizon. And we have folks here for that. Hello. And if you could uh, introduce yourself, please. Hi, good evening. My name's Jerry Mullingoski. I'm with Western Mass Electric out of our Springfield office. Could you spell your last name, please? Sure, M M O L. O N G O S K I. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so this public hearing is called to order at 6:55, and so we have information in our packets. Tell us about these polls, please. Yes, we're petitioning the town to place two new polls on um, the southerly side of uh, Mill Lane um, between the residents. Um, or house numbers 135, 145, and 157. Um, and this work is being done as part of a reliability project um, during the snowstorm. We had a number of problems on this circuit um, related mostly to trees. But um, so, so we, we do this uh, work called circuit hardening, which we look at the, the circuits that were most heavily affected by the storms, uh, and we do uh, a number of things to try to improve the reliability, um, such as deteriorated poles or, or pole tops, um, in outdated equipment or insulators, um, and enhanced tree trimming. The, the combination of that work really helps, you know, in a future storm to, pro, you know, to, to reduce the outages. Um, these two poles are, are, are going to be placed on the property lines where now, now the, the, the length of spans uh, is, is very long. Uh, we're looking to reduce those spans uh, because the tr with the long, long spans between poles with our conductor, if a tree comes down, that does, you know, it's more likely to cause an outage. So these poles would enable us to reduce the length 
of, of span between and also align them with the property owners property you know property lines between the properties um, I did meet with the owners of the properties on site and they were agreeable to uh, what was proposed in in this petition um, in fact the owner of 145 there was the existing pole there which is very deteriorated was uh, quite close to their driveway so when they backed down it was difficult so they were happy to have the relocation as proposed um, we also just as a side note uh, worked with our, our tree coordinator worked with the owners here um, and it was in fact large pine trees that took took this circuit out in the storm in the in the uh, snowstorm last year last October uh, and we've taken a number of trees um, both within the road taking and back onto private prop property that were problematic uh, with the you know at the agreement of the property owners they were concerned about you know the, the houses their trees falling on their houses and we of course were concerned about our our plant reliability so it worked out well um, so that that's it the petition uh, shows the the relocate you know the new poles as opposed to the existing poles and the one that would be relocated or removed so for folks who are following along at home, all of the materials, including a map about this, is in our online packet. Uh, questions or comments from Select Board? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I just want to be clear. The, the, these poles are on the town right-of-way. They're not on the properties. No. You, they're just working with the owners about how the cable is going to fly to their house or whatever. Yes. And the trees. Yes, yeah. that's been okay. discussed. Yes, and they are within the, within the road taking. I also and I, appreciate the map, by the way. Okay. And I also did meet with... Uh, <clears throat> representatives from the highway department just to be sure that it didn't have to interfere with any plant and uh, it's it's located well other questions or comments from select board questions or comments from the public all right uh, so I had uh, requested specifically information from uh, Department of Public Works about any tree concerns, and the information we got back was that they had no concerns whatsoever, so we'll assume that that includes the, the tree part. Um, it's great that you were able to deal specifically directly with the property owners so that this wasn't a, a surprise or a concern or anything. Yeah, we, we generally try to, you know, to work with the property owners with placement of poles prior to submitting the petition. All right, then, uh, without objection, this public hearing is closed at 6.59. And Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? And then we shall deliberate it. Sure. I move that the select board grant permission to construct and maintain poles, wires, cables, and fixtures, including the necessary sustaining and protecting fixtures to be owned and used in common by Western Massachusetts Electric Company and Verizon New England Incorporated on the southerly side of Mill Lane, the first said pole, parens, WEMCO number 86-13, Verizon number 12, and parens, to be located at a point approximately 1,715 Parens number 1,715 feet. Um, parens easterly from the center line of West Street on the lot line of house numbers 135 and 145. And the second pole, Parens Wemco number 3M, Verizon number 1, 2 and 1 half. And parens to be installed on the lot line of house numbers 145 and 157 and to remove existing parens Wemco number 13 comma Verizon number 12 and parens on the front of house number 145 in accordance with the plan number 6A220173 um, period second second all right, further discussion. Mr. Hayden. Who comes with a pole number 12 and a half? I just <laughs> it's an intermediate pole. <laughs> so, so they uh, telephone calls it their one half. Wamiko calls it their M, M. or, in, in, or media, you know, immediate. 
yeah, just a, and the numbers don't always co coincide. They could number one way on the street and we would name number the opposite. Keeps so. things interesting. <laughs> Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Ms. Brewer. I have a question completely <coughs> unrelated to the poll hearing while we have the representative here. All right. Something we generally <laughs> try not to do, but I'm going to do anyway, because fortunately this wasn't a situation, um, unlike some others that we've had, where you're not replacing it in exactly the same spot. There's a real purpose to it, and it mentions that the other is being removed. There, um, a couple of people have brought up just in passing that associated with all the storm damage, et cetera, that there are situations where there are double poles. What do people do to express their dissatisfaction that there's still an old pole right next to a new pole? What's the right thing for them to? We really have, we have a system for, for a long time, we didn't have a great system for tracking those poles. For the last six or seven years, we have a very good system which tracks the double poles. Mm -hmm. Um, both um, you know, the, the maintenance areas are, sh are shared with, with Verizon or Wamico by, by territory. It was just sp split up uh, geographically years ago. But we do have a tracking system to keep you know, count of those double poles. Um, and, and we do have a time frame that we try to get them removed in. Um, I can say one thing that, that there are a lot of double poles now that haven't been removed be, w due to the fact that there were so many broken during the storm. It takes a long time for, for each of the other companies to come, out, come behind Verizon and Wamico okay. to transfer their cables and services. Um, and the, the other thing is the uh, broadband project that's going on now, there are, every town is having numerous poles changed out to accommodate them their space or, or space for them on the poles so we're we're frantic to build the the poles so that they can get in there <coughs> um and and we are notified when the other companies are off those poles and then we will employ or we, we do employ a contractor to come in and put, pull out the poles once all the other companies are off okay. but it probably i can um, there if you call into wamico there is a representative that can can take that information, but odds are very good that we already have that right. that location. It's just that it hasn't. It's just that, to that point it's yet. yeah. There's an exceptional number of poles out there that right. are, are double poles right now. Well, good. Thank but you. But I, I do know I do know the the Wamico contact for that, and mm -hmm. and I'll bring that up to him that, okay. that that there is a concern for the amount of double poles out there. Right. And see if we can you know maybe employ extra folks to do that. Because like you said, it's not like you drive up and one person takes out the pole and you do something else. There's a whole yeah. series of things that has to happen. But we do we do track it very okay. well. Great. It's just trying to I get to We it. will continue to share that with people. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great. So Thank you. All set. Thank you very much for coming in this evening. Thank we you. Appreciate it. Me too. All right. Next up, we have a common vitulers license. Are you Mr. Hopton? Yes. Please come forward and introduce yourself for our folks at home. I am Trevor Hopton, who is hoping to open a restaurant on 27 South Pleasant, along with my brother, who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, Spencer Hopton. Terrific. Um, so 27 South Pleasant, so we always talk about everything as far as what it used to be. So wh which space okay, is this? Okay, it's the Shea, Shea <laughs> Albert space. Okay, Thank that you. was my bet. All right, excellent. And now what kind of a restaurant is it going to be? This is just for, this is an advertisement opportunity. We're not going okay, to, we're not going to oppose or uh, support this right. based on the information you give us. Thank you. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, it's going to be over the counter, upscale, I could say, or at least elevated hamburger sandwich slash bistro. Everything homemade, locally sourced produce and meat. We can grind our own beef. Possibly make, make the rolls too, though that's a little iffy given space we're discovering. But um, we hope to be open 11 to 11, seven days a week and just be a great casual place to come in for both students and, you know, town workers. Great. And what kind of a time frame are you looking at for opening? We hope to open last week of July. Oh, great. Wonderful. If, 
yeah, if all goes well. Other questions or comments for Mr. Hopton? Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? Actually, I do have a question. Go right ahead. Um, will there be tables to sit down as well as over the counter or takeaway? Oh, or? Yeah, I'm sorry. There will, there will be 11 tables. Okay. We'll seat 22 people. Okay. And by over the counter, I mean that it's just counter service. service. There won't be okay. wait staff. Great. Please. I move that the select board grant a common Victoria Earth license to operate Metacomet Incorporated at 27 South Pleasant Street, Amherst, with hours of operation from 11 a.m. to 11 uh, p.m. seven days a week, E. Spencer and Tre Tre Trevor Hopton managers pending approval of inspections and health department licensing requirements. Second. Further discussion. I'll just ask, do you say Metacomet or Metacomet? How do you say it? <laughs> Metacomet. Metacomet. I've been saying but it that, wrong that's all those years. That's a very good question. Whether, oh, really? As an Indian name originally, it was Metacomet, though I've never heard that. Huh. The only I, I hope it's Metacomet. No, it is, because the okay. leak is Metacomet. And there is a Metacomet Lake not far from here. I've always said the Metacomet and Monadnock Trail. But see? <laughs> well, That's what happens when you just see it spelled. Yeah. But you don't hear somebody say, all right, never mind. I, I mispronounce <laughs> everything else, but that's the only <laughs> one that I remember from the lake. So, All right, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Congratulations. We look forward oh, to your thank opening. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming thank in you. tonight. I, I just want to say one other yes. thing, and that is thank you for applying for this ahead of time, because sometimes <laughs> establishments have been known to open without this license in hand. Well, so good for you. Yes. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck and bon appetit. And I'll, I'll also just uh, thank uh, staff on the third floor as well as on the second floor for, for improving that process. It's really, exactly. it's never, it's never the, the applier's fault that they end up late in the queue. <laughs> so we're doing a much better job of making the process work well internally and making sure that that happens. Great. So thank you very much for coming in. All right. Let's see. So apparently I gave everything... 10 minutes tonight on a night where everything is taking five minutes. So let's see, we'll do. Alyssa tried. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, sorry? Aren't we on time for? Not quite. Well, that clock isn't the same as right. We're, we're, only, we're only a minute short here. So. Yeah, now it's 7 and Which is the same as 7 10 <laughs> Mr. Malloy, come forward. We will uh, deal with you mere seconds before we were supposed to get to you on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Hayden. I just want to say that I work for uh, a, a company that owns a lot of property in this district, but I'm not going to recuse myself this time. That's right. So uh, Mr. Hayden was very wise to mention this to me before the meeting. Uh, you'll recall that he recused himself when we dealt with the local historic district recommendation on the warrant article, which um, I think was a good idea because he works for Amherst College. It occurred to me only after the fact, sadly, that it's possible that Mr. Wald maybe should have recused himself too, but it didn't even occur to me at the time. But anyway, so now we think that we're all in the free and clear here because we are only now carrying out the... Uh, uh, the requirement that town meeting authorized us to do. So anyway, no one's recusing themselves tonight. So this is about uh, our having just gone through town meeting where the local historic district committee was, uh, local historic district was approved. Now we need to, um, by state law, uh, establish the committee that will have uh, regulatory, if you call it, uh, authority over this district. And we have a bunch of information from Mr. Wald and Mr. Malloy. So why don't you tell us about these next steps, the establishment of the committee and, and what comes next? Sure. Um, I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town of Amherst. The, um, uh, the next steps, uh, there, there's a few. You know, the select board is appointing authority of the local historic uh, or the district commission. Um, you know, that involves, you know, um, reviewing and appro approving a charge and then um, authorizing town staff to solicit nominees. So uh, this Historic District Commission is a seven-member uh, commission, and um, the idea is that you get uh, you know, residents, at least two residents of the district, two architects, two realtors, and a member of the Historical Society. And so we'd solicit nominees from those, um, those areas of expertise, and uh, there's a 30-day waiting period to hear from, from anyone. 
if there uh, if there are no responses, then the select board can appoint at will. Um, but the idea is to try to get you know people with professional and personal experience and you know, vested interest from the district. Um, this also goes before the attorney general, so there's a pretty large filing that has to happen, like you know similar to zoning and other measures that are passed. So they review the bylaw, the um, final report, uh, all the documents to make sure everything happened according to uh, you know state law and in the Massachusetts Historical Commission. <clears throat> so these things can happen concurrently. So the, um, the idea is that I think tomorrow we'll try to get everything filed with the Attorney General's office. Um, you know, and then that, that can take um, a number of days, maybe months. Um, <laughs> and then in the meantime, uh, you know, staff um, has been talking to uh, residents of the district and will, um, you know, form formally notify them with a letter also, it could be a solicitation for anyone interested to serve on the district commission. But you know, the idea is to get a packet ready for everyone in the district, so information about permitting, um, you know, individualized national register nominations for each property, so it would be tailored to each property, but then also the bylaw, the final report, um, just be enough information to get them started. And um, you know, I think after that, uh, once everything happens, you know, it could take a few months before um, a, a commission is appointed, then uh, the commission itself needs to meet and approve rules and regulations, approve a permit application form. And then uh, you know, with the select board um, approval, the uh, bylaw and map needs to be recorded with the registry and with the town clerk. And so that, that's what um, triggers the district uh, becoming effective. So up until that point, um, you know, everything is just, um, you know, it's leading up to it. So until the, the map and the bylaws recorded, the district isn't effective, and that's at the discretion of the select board. Uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission has, you know, said that really each community has its own pace, so there isn't a timeline necessarily. It's just a matter of when things can, you know, how how we'd like it to happen. So it's the select board's discretion, but um, would that be something that the the committee would make a recommendation on, or, or, or what are you folks, as sort of our experts here, what are you thinking for that? when that might be do you right. do you put that to the committee or you're going to recommend to us at some point right I think uh, staff has been talking and uh, with Jim Wald too he was the liaison um, for the study committee and you know the idea is I think to get everything moving as fast as we can and then you know try to get the district commission appointed and, and um, you know I know it's the summer so things can be slow but you know I was thinking you know in September to try to have at least a meeting with the historic district commission if we can get enough interest and in, you know people apply for a CAF um, that doesn't mean that it would become effective, but I think they should, you know, meet once or twice, you know, get to know each other, formalize, you know, formalize the rules and regulations, and um, I think at that point we could, you know, make a recommendation to the select board. So it just, you know, first see who's on the district commission. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wild, is there anything you'd like to add about any of this? Not particular. I think Mr. Malloy has covered everything. Just again, also want to express our thanks to town staff really for helping us to get this through because. I mean, we're, you know, a lot of small towns don't have the benefit of a planning staff that has expertise in things such as historic preservation. So, in fact, the state says that it's not always a good idea to try it because, you know, the citizens out there, this is one of the concerns. What will this committee be doing, you know, making decisions? And so one reason that we have confidence in the whole process is because we have a good experience with citizen boards for zoning, for design review, and everything else, but also because we have expert town staff who can really support it. We wouldn't have gone forward without that. So. Uh, that's why I think also it's a prudent plan, you know, to try to get things up and ready by the fall and then s take things as they come. Thank you. That's an excellent point. Um, and, and thank you really for all, all of the details you've had to marshal and manage to get us to this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love what you said about preparing a packet for everybody in the district. That seems like an incredibly user-friendly thing to do to make sure that everybody really understands what, what this is and what this isn't. And so, uh, so that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, did I see hands on the side, Ms. Brewer? Um, minor and then the more substantial. In terms of uh, when it says on the draft created by town, by law, town meeting action, we need to specify that it was annual town meeting 2012 and what the article number was, you know, because that's what we just need to do. It does have the date, though. But more importantly, in terms of the solicitation of the applicants, it does talk about the written request for nominees to any of the organizations. Oh. Um, for those of us, all of us would have been here for when we did this for the local historic district committee 
and we went through all that miracle rule of having to send it to the real estate, you know, the, mm-hmm. the blanket organization and this organization that. So I figure select board members don't necessarily really need to be involved in any of that, but if, if staff, select board, town manager staff can work with Nate on how we did that the last time, it seemed to work. And then we eventually got CAFs associated with all of those organizations, and then we can go through our appointment process. But this is different than all our other sorts of appointment processes because we have to solicit from these very specific agencies and then see if they don't respond and yada yada. But it's like all coming back to me in a haze, and Mr. Wald remembers it all too. Well, he so, was on select board back then. <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping that's right. So I'm hoping that this is more of a, you know, a, a technical sort of administrative task at this point at this point in the process and then once all that happens then the select board can start taking action but that um, you know you just have to give people time you have to send the letter out to the real estate association then give them time to send somebody back etc so all right thank you yeah so i've already reached out to some of those organizations just letting them know that something would be coming and so right so like the western mass chapter of the aia they meet maybe monthly and so you know if you miss a cycle then by the time they meet and you know so it could be you know, you know, a month and a half before people are notified that this is happening, um, or they could vote on it. So. Good, good. All right. So then, so we've got the draft charge. Miss Brewer made her uh, comments about being specific about this annual town meeting, the dates, the article number. Um, did anybody have any other questions or comments about the charge itself, Mr. Hayden? Yeah, I just, just, uh, I'm curious, you say that it's still a couple of days away from the AG signing off on it. What do we think the chances of that are, uh, given how close this used to the actual state um, uh, regulation that you cite here? Oh, right. So, <clears throat> you know, I think uh, the Massachusetts Historical Commission reviewed the preliminary study report, which included the bylaw, uh, you know, and the draft rules and regulations, and they didn't have any comment um, as to the form. Um, town staff and town council have also reviewed it. And so, you know, I think the AG's office will look both at uh, that we follow procedure, timelines, and everything. But um, you know, there's a, there's always a, a possibility that they find something um, that may need to be changed. Uh, you know, I don't think that'll happen, but um, you know, it's it's there. Uh, Never know, Miss Stein. The first two bullet points under uh, responsibility shall include. Uh, don't read as very nice English to me. Is that actually the way they are um, from the bylaw or? I mean, review and regulation construction and or alteration. That's the funny juxtaposition of words. And the next one says adoption and amendments to rules and. Right, yeah, so that's that's um, that's taken from the bylaw. And so it, um, you know, that I, I, you know, it was summarized from the bylaw. I didn't want to synthesize too much just to keep it as, you know, as specific as it could be. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it could be changed a little bit, uh, you know, Good. put into other pros, but I was just keeping it. Um, okay. So just to be clear, so you're talking about there are some things like one is a noun and one is a verb or whatever, so to put it them. It just to me seems like, um, like the like it could be have better pros. Okay. okay. So, so I'll make a suggestion and send it to me and I don't know if it will be useful or not. Okay. So you may or may not be able to make that change. Right. Okay. Good. Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I was just going to say I mean it's an, it's a matter of making a regulation which is a noun and the, the verb regulate right. and then right. it Yes, becomes. exactly. That sort of thing. Right. Nothing nothing dramatic. <clears throat> oh, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, comments are welcome. <laughs> okay. Ms. Brewer. One of the things that's kind of unusual about about this um, exciting and very happy project is that although we're really good now about referencing and it's very clear that it is part associated with the bylaw that the two are inextricably combined you know this isn't just a charge that looks at some MGL section that may or may not seem particularly that useful in day-to-day basis this is very clearly based on the bylaw that was passed by town meeting one of the things that's a little odd about it though is that it doesn't until the very end of the bylaw talk about where it is that it does this and i know that it's because i know that we only have the one right now and we wouldn't you know get a whole new historic district commission if we had two but i'm just wondering what's the way to say without people you know if somebody wants to just look at the charge of the historic district commission what's the way of saying without reading all the stuff the area that the historic district commission works on is this like what 
is there a simple way to do that that would just in case people have that question oh yeah you have one of those and it's just for this one section of town right now right now I think that's a good point um, you know some communities they'll have you know separate district commissions you know possibly reviewed you know each each district or they may have just one review all of them so uh, I guess you know that's a good point it can be a matter of preference we could um, mention it up front that this is in the Dickinson you know district area and then um, if other districts are approved or something changes that can always be changed as well but um, you know it could also refer to the map I guess if that you know we could also attach the map to the charge of something like that that just makes it immediate you know one you can go look at the bylaw and two it's it's this piece <laughs> it just mm -hmm. yeah okay it's unusual we don't have a, a checkbox for that right now but if you can think of a, a way to reference that that'd be great mr. Eden um, this didn't strike me until just now so I, I like the idea of making the Dick, Dickinson historic district the way it was at town meeting and that was part of the name of the Warren article but that's mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if this um, the, the special municipal employee status should be yes mm -hmm very specifically because there are going to be people on the committee um, who do have a financial interest in the work of the committee and the conflict of interest laws change with the yes and the no. With the no, they're not, they're not allowed to participate in actions that they have a financial interest in, like for instance, the affecting the value of their home. If they are special municipal employees, they can make the statement, get the clearance, and move on. That's not my understanding of special municipal employee. I believe it's about them representing uh, themselves before other with other boards and committees. So if you were to if you were to be uh, on the local historic district committee, but you were also on the some other important committee, I don't know, conservation commission. Conservation commission. Um, no, if you were to bring clients before the Conservation Commission, if you were a special municipal, if you were a municipal employee by nature of your service on the local historic district committee, you would need to be a special municipal employee in order to be able to represent your clients before the Conservation Commission. You can never, it, SME doesn't keep you, doesn't um, protect you from conflict of interest within your own committee. But you do raise an interesting question, so the question is how you deal with that. But I don't think that I don't think special municipal employee is. But the then, tool. then that also precludes any of these folks from being on another committee that doing any work on this area. Um, so I guess I'm not saying that I think that it shouldn't <clears throat> yeah. be special municipal employee to, because I think every committee should be. It just makes more <laughs> sense to me. Um, but I'm not sure that it deals with the specific concern that you're talking about. Um, so Ms. Brewer knows a lot about these things. So what are your reactions to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, the reason it says no right now, of course, is because the committee hasn't solicited SME status because they right. don't exist okay. yet. But we could we could put it into effect right now. We just have to, and the only the only reason to hesitate on that is so we make sure we represent to the committee members what it actually is because there has been no end of confusion as to what SME status actually does on the ground for people in any number of situations. And while I agree completely with Ms. O'Keefe, I think it's partially, I think it can, it can add to the case associated with the financial issue, but it's not the carte blanche that people think it is associated with the financial issue. So um, I have no problem with going ahead and saying that yes, we would vote at the same time. We, it, you know, if we're waiting to, for the charge to come back, because obviously we, they have other things to do, we could we could put you know special municipal employee status granted such and such date, and that would be fine. And then people would get that as part of their orientation. But we, you know, we still have the old SMA status on the website. It's something that we need to work on because it's a it's a concern, and I think this is a particular one that. We want town council, particularly if they already happen to represent other communities where they already have local <clears throat> historic districts, mm -hmm. um, that would be incredibly helpful to have. We might need to get a little, see if they have a guidance memo or anything associated with this to help people out that way because exactly, people aren't going to want to apply if they feel like it's too murky. And I actually don't remember how this conversation did go with the local aspect of it that we knew was a temporary sort of thing. Yeah, I'm particularly concerned for the mem not only for the people who actually own property there who might want to serve on another committee doing something else, but also for members of the AIA whose profession is representing people 
two boards and committees here in town. And you know, that, that's it, a difficult thing for them. If I could just interject, yeah, staff um, was speaking with the, um, the, um, direct, the president of the Western Ma uh, Mass Chapter, the AIA. He, he alluded to, you know, conflict of interest problems. So staff has discussed it internally, and we're getting a memo out to town council just to ask for clarification. Um, because, right, I mean, the idea is that you would want professionals serving. They have the expertise, but then if, you know, if people are worried about conflict of interest or a violation of ethics and they, you know, so they don't want to then sit on the commission, you're losing, you know, losing valuable resource. So uh, we're, 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 we've already thought of that and we're thinking of ways to see if we can address it. Okay, great. Um, to Ms. Brewer's other point about um, making further revisions to the charge, are you expecting to do that or you want us to approve the charge tonight? No, there's, uh, no, I think it was just important just to, um, you know, just to get it in front of you and you can have time to review it. It doesn't have to happen tonight. I okay. think, you know, I think there are some, you know, people have some comments and questions, so that's fine. It can get, it can come back to me and. Uh, They're small, but right. there's no rush either. Right. Mr. Misanti. Yeah, I think that's a good approach. And um, I, I agree that it's an important issue that would be best addressed up front before uh, before the committee's appointed, um, and I, uh, Ms. O'Keefe's uh, summary that the conflict of interest law applies with or without the status in terms of your work on the Hi Historic District Commission. But given the concerns, I think it is something we want to get a specific recommendation to you on early on here because that may, may help us with recruitment of the best possible members to the commission. Exactly. So I don't think that this select board would have any issue with granting special it's municipal right. employee status to this committee when the charge is created. Is that right? Like we're all nodding. So, so that, that won't be an issue. Sure. So whenever, okay. whenever you want to bring the recommendation to us, I'm sure we'll approve it. Okay. Other questions or comments about this then? All right. So then people should give you further comment about the charge or you think you've kind of synthesized the things that people I have mean, mentioned? If, uh, Diana, if you want, I'll, you know, I'll you can, just send it to Nate sure. in writing. It's, it's minor, okay. but it would be better English. It really would. Okay. And so Ms. Brewer had the technical points about the, um, right. The language, the, about the articles and more the town meeting dates. Um, did anybody else have anything else that they want included? Okay, so then probably this can come back to us for approval on Monday, perhaps, because we don't meet again until the middle of July. Okay. Yep. So, yep. you're meaning the whole charge or what? Yes, just okay. the charge. We won't have bodies yet. But no, no, right. No. Just At least the charge. you can say, okay, the charge is done. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Right. I it just um, in talking about your whole kind of right. the the lag times and everything as part of the process. Right. I don't want you to have to wait until the middle of July for us to sure. um, deal with this again. Okay, are we good with all this? Any other questions or comments for Mr. Malloy? Good, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Appreciate your coming in and all the good information, Ms. Brewer. It says right in the memo, I mean, I'm sorry, in the motion sheet that it's Article 27, <clears throat> right. sorry. <laughs> but you can include that, because right. you knew that off the top of your head anyway. <laughs> but uh, thanks. Yeah, thank all right, you. we're good? Very good, all right, thank you. Yeah, now it is. So are we going to go ahead with this motion or not? No. Oh, that, there's nothing no. to approve now. We'll do that next time. Right. Okay. Okay. So that was 710. So 720 item is um, accept temporary easement for Amherst College bike path bridge construction. This is uh, dealing with the bridge over Snell Street in order to prevent a very long detour. Amherst College has, um, has very... Uh, kindly provided a right-of-way detour through some of their property to accommodate the public on the bike path during that construction period. Um, we had had this before us before. This is already this has already gone before. Where have we dealt with this already? At town meeting. Town meeting. That's yes. right. Town meeting approved the easement. It approved the select board accepting the easement. So um, it has already been through that process. This was supposed to be approved by us a couple of weeks ago, but the um, the language of the easement wasn't quite right. Now it is all right, and we're ready to approve it. So essentially, it's a technicality at this point. We do have the maps and information in our packets. Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motion? I would. 
I move that the select board, pursuant to the authority granted under Article 13 of the November 7, 2011 Special Town Meeting, as continued, to accept from Amherst College a temporary access and construction easement as shown on the accompanying layout plan, parens attachment, attachment C in parenthesis, said it easement to be used during the replacement of the Snell Street Rail Trail Bridge. As someone who uses this frequently, I gratefully second. <laughs> Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That is unanimous. Thank you. All right. Next up is our post town meeting wrap up discussion. Uh, we started doing this a couple of years ago. I think it's a good thing to do to just kind of <clears throat> take a couple minutes and look back on town meeting, in particular our processes and uh, and how they went. Any kind of comment that we want to think about for changing <clears throat> things for the future, or comment that we want to pass along to other groups. So. Town meeting now seems blessedly long ago, but uh, is it still in your mind enough that you uh, have any thoughts about how it went? Any uh, thoughts on how it might improve? Anyone, Miss Brewer? I forgot my notes. Okay. Just thought I'd mention that I did actually make a couple while we were at town meeting <laughs> on my town meeting book, which is not in my. Mind. I ripped out my my little piece of my finance committee <laughs> book that it was on my cover. Like <laughs> You okay. Very clever. Well, we'll Maybe start. We can continue. Start and it'll be clear. <laughs> All right. I can start. All right. Um, so let's see. The my comments. Some of them are for us to talk about. Some of them I might just uh, I might just send them to them. Um, one of the things that. I thought I would say in general I thought things went very well. I thought the select board's preparation during uh, late March and April went very well. Uh, again, appreciate very much the office's help, Deborah uh, Roussel in particular's help in coordinating folks to get all of the articles to us, uh, to get all the, the presenters and the articles ready for us to take our positions on beforehand. Um, that it, it really is nice to go into town meeting essentially with all of our work done because having to do that in the meetings before town meeting is, is a great big hassle. So, uh, so I think that worked well. I think all the little tweaks we've been kind of making along the way worked well. The master script worked well that the select board office started doing, I believe, a year ago. Um, I don't know whose idea it was, but I thought it worked also very well as a tweak was the uh, tally cards, only getting one set of tally cards and then one backup set later in case we needed it. That was much better than getting a set, a new set every night of town meeting and it felt good to not be kind of wasting all that paper. Mm -hmm. um, the um, one thing that I had mentioned personally, not from the select board discussion, but personally to TMCC last year, but I'll bring it up to see if you want to endorse it because they weren't interested in last year, um, is uh, I think that they should consider and, and champion the use of the consent calendar. I think that it would be a difficult thing for the moderator to do or for anybody else to kind of initiate, but I think if it came from TMCC saying that, yes, this would be something that, that could improve uh, the flow of things a bit, then then that would have some weight with the body. I mean, they'd need to talk about it and, and see if it's worthwhile, but I've thought a lot about it, and there are really only a, a handful of articles that could even be considered for the consent calendar, but at the same time, they're all very clear, <laughs> you know, and each one of them does have a certain amount of infrastructure that's built around it, that if you put them all together, it would be quicker. Um, people always say, well, you know, there's always new town meeting members, so there's always somebody new who, who hasn't heard the explanation. Very true. However, we have an incredibly detailed finance committee report. So there's just, it, it takes a lot of, a lot of the momentum of the first night to deal with a bunch of these things that really are kind of technicality articles. So how would the select board feel about asking TMCC to consider the, the consent calendar and, and recommending that, Ms. Stein? I'm smiling because you're going to get rid of all the things I love to present, but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> okay, Ms. Brewer. I agree with what she said wholeheartedly, <laughs> both parts of it, because 
absolutely, I mean, we always are walking that line when we're here at this meeting <clears throat> too, in terms of education of the public about a new topic versus materials ahead of time. You know, we want to pe have people not have things be completely meaningless if they haven't read the stuff ahead of time. But you know what, for town meeting, you're required to read it ahead of time. And if you don't understand it, then that's the time you ask at the warrant review or whatever. Or if you think that something really makes no sense whatsoever, you can ask to have it taken out of the consent calendar. But I find it very frustrating that there seems to be some tiny little current within town meeting that thinks that you should be able to walk in cold and have everything explained to you. Like, no, that's not what we do with town meeting. That's why the finance committee book goes out two weeks ahead of time. That's why there's a year-round list serve. So these very straight, you know, you have to do it every year kind of thing. It doesn't make any sense to listen to random questions that could be answered somewhere else when, the, you know, to encourage it to be part of a consent calendar, I think tells us that people don't have to feel bad if they don't ask questions. <laughs> and I, I think that if there's something that people have questions about, yeah. um, then, then maybe that shouldn't be in the consent calendar, right. but it only takes one person to move to, to take it mm -hmm. out of the consent yeah. calendar. I, I'm talking more about the things that there are no questions for. So right. we go through the same sort of rigmarole of, of you know, you, you go through the motion, you speak to the motion, you explain it, you do the positions on it, blah, 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 and then it's just a unanimous vote. There's not even any discussion about it. And so you do that through four or five <laughs> or six of them. If they were all in the consent calendar, then it would just be one simple rigmarole, <laughs> Ms. Burke. If I could just add a clarifying sentence to that. Partly what I was referring to was that they don't have to feel bad if they don't ask a question because I noticed it particularly that with this town meeting session that I think because it was not in a consent calendar, the moderator felt obligated to solicit questions and like that was totally unnecessary. <laughs> and so I think it gives him the feeling like, okay, if somebody wants to pull it out, they can, but otherwise it's not required to ask questions. All right, so we're good with asking TMCC to, to yeah. consider this more and look into that because it does it would potentially have some benefits. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting, uh, and I hadn't thought about it before, and it, it wasn't until after town meeting that I looked it up and saw that it's actually part of our general bylaws, which would require a, a, a town meeting mm -hmm. vote to change. But um, we have the system of five minutes for the maker of the motion and then three minutes for everything after that. And I think that in general, that's good, any follow-up um, question or comment. Um, but I, I actually think it's a problem that people who are answering questions are confined to the three minutes. Like you ought to be able to confine your, your statement about something to three minutes or your question about something, but the answer might be more complicated than three minutes. And you can't really know because you haven't prepared ahead of time for a specific answer. You know, you're not gonna ask ahead of time, could I have two extra minutes to answer this question? So then you get to an awkward point as happened with the town manager who's, who's giving a detail answer to a question and then the body shuts him off this is it's awkward for multiple reasons one is you the, the answerer hasn't had the full opportunity to answer the question it might take more than three minutes and it's these things are typically being answered by the folks at the front table who don't <coughs> have the timer in front of them anyway um, so I think it I think that that's, if we were ever to look into changing <laughs> bylaws, I think that that's kind of a funny one that I'm not sure you can justify having that, having the answers be, um, be covered by that also. But I don't, I don't think I'd, I feel strongly enough or that it's a big enough problem to recommend going through the changing <coughs> of our bylaws to, to deal with it. But I wanted to throw that out there, see what folks think. <clears throat> Go ahead, raise your hand, because I'm going to if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, start with Ms. Stein. <laughs> I, I think if somebody like uh, Mr. Musanti is going to give a, uh, suspects that his answer is going to take longer, I would go ahead and ask for the two minutes. What difference does it make if you finish in three? That will show whoever, you know, for whoever the answer is, I think it shows the body that you're willing to obey, you know, that sort of, um, regulation, shall we say, of three minutes or five minutes, whatever. Um, I tend to come in short because I don't like to, you know, take up any more town meeting, but I think other people have a different approach and that's fine, but they should ask for th the extra two minutes since that seems to be the rules of the game. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess my point I is know. just yeah. you, you, you prepare for your remarks. You know, you prepare right. to your right. motion I, to I speak to the motion. I see your point completely. Um, but you don't prepare an answer, and, right. and the answer might be complicated. But right. it's but, not a huge it, issue. No, but I think it's a valid point. And I'm just saying when you think, you know, it's going to take longer because it, you have to give a more complicated, more nuanced answer that to say ahead of time, you know, I think sure. this might take five minutes and then... I think town meeting would feel that they were being respected. Mr. Reed. I mean, that, that brings up, you know, I think it's a great idea, but it brings up a couple of interesting questions, which I'm sure, you know, I'll be meeting with the TMCC, I think it's Wednesday, that they're getting ready for Harrison next Monday. There's a whole bunch of scheduling going on. But um, I see that creating two classes of town meeting discussion. The debate, which, you know, you're limited to your three minutes, and then sort of something else. And, and really, I think your observation um, might be the town meeting already is moving that way, where there's a discussion beforehand, sort of before the debate goes on, but getting to understand it, and the questions go back and forth. And that's not the debate. That's sort of establishing, um, you know, the, 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 the facts that then will be debated beyond. Um, so that's that's kind of an interesting. I don't know. I guess the, the general bylaw, the, the town meeting. I would have to figure out if that's a town meeting process rule or if that is a. It is. It's part of Article I mean, One the, of the general bylaws or whatever it's called. I think yeah, it's called I think yeah, the general it, bylaws. It's and it says you know five minutes for the maker of the motion and three minutes for each subsequent speaker. Right. So. But but the intention there is to regulate debate, not the question. You know. Correct. So, correct. So that, that's, that's, um, and that's but, so there's two but it does things, say but, each subsequent. But so it, I'm it, not does, sure how it does. Much, yeah, the how general bylaw doesn't differentiate between wrong. the two. Right. right. So we'll go to Mr. Wild then, Ms. Brewer. Oh no, I, I'm quite sympathetic to the problem. I understand the Ms. Stein's point about the procedure because I think part of what happened in the case of the town manager is that though he was answering a question and providing expert technical information, it was seen as being a partisan answer that was supporting one. You know, it's very hard to disentangle information from debate when there's discussion going on. So I think that was part of the problem too. I don't know what the answer is, but I think that's why people were concerned. Right. And I don't want to, I don't want to, that wasn't the only time this happens. I mean, people who are answering questions, it happens with the school folks also. You know, you, you don't know what the question is going to be, so the answer could be, you know, all kinds of right. things. Um, so it did happen a lot, not just with the town manager, but that was one that got a lot of attention. So, Ms. Brewer. When we talk about two different classes of speakers, I think one of the things that we have, um, that has been true you know, not that I remember every town meeting session since 1999, although I've been I to 99% so. <laughs> of them. Um, it's, this, is a, this is a moderator management issue again, because over my experience in town meeting, what would happen was there were, there were speakers, which were the select board, the finance committee, individual audience members, conservation commission, and then there were answers provided by Mr. Mooring or Mr. And so when you don't, when it's very, when the town manager made it clear where he, or I should say the town moderator, I'm sorry, when the town moderator would say, Mr. Mooring, do you want to answer that? There was no question as to whether or not Mr. Mooring was going to get three or five minutes. That it was just a non-issue because he wasn't a speaker. He was answering a question. However, there was definitely a new political vein in town meeting this time around where people said, hey, wait, the school committee, wait, the superintendent, wait. You know, and, and weren't looking at it the same way because there is that fine line between answering a question and promoting a position. And so I think it's a discussion mainly for TMCC to have with the moderator as to what his expectation is because it's one thing if the town manager is raising his hand because he wants to provide more information. It's another thing if someone asks a direct question and they say, Chief Livingstone, what do you want to say to that? And then Chief Livingston should be able to talk for 10 minutes if that's how long it takes to answer the question without having to ask ahead of time for eight minutes because it's a direct question. But it starts to get muddy. And so I think that it was not managed the same way it was before. And I think there was a political strain that, that people felt cheated. And so if people are going to feel cheated, then obviously everyone should ask for the time. But it, it gets kind of silly when it's you know asking the DPW guy to come all the way down from the upper Right, to, to answer yes or no on a you know a simple question. Yes, Mr. Meyer might need four and a half minutes to answer that question about. So I, I definitely think it's a discussion though that should take place at least between TMCC and the moderator with you know we could put in our two cents that we're concerned about it because it was different this year, 
and people were obviously frustrated. And I think before it's been managed somewhat differently by the same moderator. So, uh, so it, it may be partially rules and partially kind of shared expectations. Yes, so it'll exactly. be an interesting, it'll be an interesting right. thing for a TMCC to chew on, and, uh, and we'll see, Mr. Hayden. And, and I think the the point uh, we, sh we shouldn't lose the point of, of of raising the suggestion, and that is that town meeting can be more effective, can use town meeting members' times more effectively. Uh, that's kind of where the asking for the two minutes sort of now you're stopping and taking a vote, and, but any event. Um, but and so you know, let's let's you know keep that ahead of us. That's effectiveness, Mr. Well, uh, yeah, and, and in that vein, I think we're also saying. I mean, it's a, if not a unique situation, unusual one in that because of the census, we had a complete re-election of members, and there are a lot of new people. And you know, you can do all the orientation you want. I don't know if the problem lay in the orientation or the fact that it wasn't absorbed. But clearly, there are a lot of people who didn't quite understand the rules. And you know, unless you've been to some of these, you don't understand. You know why calling the previous question refers to the question that's currently on the floor or what the specific procedure is and how you raise an objection how you raise a question what the difference between abstract curiosity and something vital to your decision on the vote is that's that's i don't know it's clearly an issue i was going to say anecdotally though when the historic district passed i sent out a message about that to the historic preservation list serve throughout the state you know and said on the seventh night of town meeting whatever amherst approved this and somebody wrote back and they said, must have said congratulations, but one person said, wow, seven nights, what's wrong with you people? So, you know, <laughs> here we are, I think we've done a good job that we got town meeting done in a relatively <laughs> short time, but other towns it seemed like a long one. So these things are all relative. Indeed. Okay, uh, more on that or we're good? Okay. Do you, um, do you have your next item on your list? Uh, yeah, I'll be done. Okay. That's my last one I'll talk about. No, because um, um, you're inspiring me to remember. Things, so <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, uh, so I did something that was a little bit unusual, and I did it a couple of times this year, and I just wanted to see what folks thought of it and what the any feedback that was heard. Um, so it is, in fact, again, in the rules of town meeting that no, you can't consider another article or motion after 10 o'clock without the majority support of the body. <laughs> so what I did a couple of times was put out there for consideration, do you want to move on to this article or not? And so my reasoning was that that was never a recommendation or preference from me, but that that was the only way the body gets to decide, gets to weigh in on whether it wants to keep going or not. Um, because the motion to adjourn is not a debatable motion. So. Uh, if, if I only make the motion to adjourn, then that becomes me deciding when town meeting is going to end, whereas the body should get to decide when it ends for each evening. Um, so so I, I wanted to, A, explain why I did that, and B, see, see what people thought. Now, now, I recognize it was roundly rejected every time I did it, which is perfectly fine, but I'm wondering what you think the body thought of having that opportunity and not not whether or not we should have continued later that night but what do you think of the the fact that they got to decide or not did that did they feel like that was more of a recommendation or did you hear any feedback or anything so i'll stop talking and just say that miss time i didn't hear any feedback but um i would uh if you want to do it fine but i would explain it the way you explained it now that if we go immediately to um, a motion to adjourn, then that's not a debatable motion. But if people feel they would like to go on, the only thing is my sense of the meeting is the only time they're really willing to stay till 11, say, um, and go on is when they know the end is gonna happen. That the meeting is draining to a lot of people and they just want to go home <laughs> and put their feet up and um, you know uh, catch their breath right so I, I I think you could explain it at the beginning of town meeting um, that you're going to do it sometimes to give town meeting a voice as to whether they want to go on but I will bet you dollars to donuts that the only time it's really going to happen is if it's the last meeting yeah. and that, you know, that's my feeling about it. Mr. Hayden. Well, I, I, I think, I think uh, Ms. Stein might be correct on that. On one hand, on the other hand, I mean, you, you, the first time you did it, you did explain, that was great. And um, I, I, as having been 
a member of a committee and chair of a committee that often spent time after 10 o'clock getting our work done. I think it's a good thing to offer, and I would expect it to be rejected every time. Um, I don't know if with practice and routine people understand, oh, this is something we can consider. I mean, most people have set up their <clears throat> babysitters for you know, 10 o'clock or whatever, and they, they, you know, their expectation is that they're gonna be gone by 10. And when that isn't so much expectation, you may get a different response five or 10 years down the road. I, I don't know. Someone will get a different response. It won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, also, I, you know, I'm wondering, and I'm just going to throw this out as, a, as, an, as a, a, you know, an additional idea. I mean, if, if what was next brought up was one of these things that didn't quite make it on the consent calendar but doesn't have a lot of debate att attached to it, I don't know if they would pick up, they, the town meeting members, would consider you know, dispatching one or two more small more on articles before leaving. And I, I know that means a lot of rearranging and sort of, again, mm -hmm. monkeying with the expectations. But and It's kind of an interesting thing. So I, I was doing it in thinking that it was giving the body more power instead mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. power resting Absolutely. with me as making the motion. Um, so uh, so it, it seemed like it would be a positive thing, but, but I'm not sure if that's how it was viewed. But then it I was being subjective. I was trying to take the pulse of, well, maybe this is a time they would want to do that. You know, maybe because, you know, we're in the middle of zoning and, and there were a bunch of people there for, for both zoning articles. If the majority of the body wanted to continue, then they'd have no option if I were to, to adjourn after the first one. Um, but then maybe the question is, uh, it would, do you want the, the chair of the select board using discretion? That way maybe it should be an all the time thing. Maybe, maybe every night that should happen and let the body say no, which it probably will, but, but potentially say yes, because then it doesn't look like I'm cherry picking when I do it or something mm. like that. Um, Mr. Hayden and then Ms. Burke. Yeah, I would definitely suggest or recommend or even urge you to say, yeah, offer it every night. Just make that as, as I mean, just, just the same as, you know, I don't participate in calling the question. That's not sort of our decision. It's doing it every night. It's now not our decision as well. I just, my recollection is that the two time, at least two of the times that you offered that, the next article had lots and lots mm -hmm. of people who were wanting to, to speak at great length to it, which may have been more, you know, the, the reason that they voted no and wanted to move on than, than anything else. Well, than among everything else. Right, right. And everyone will be a little bit different. Yes, so exactly. It's interesting. So, Ms. yes, Brewer. every time. Okay. I absolutely appreciate that you did it, and I, for the exact reasons that you outlined, I'm giving the power to the people to decide that I think is really important. I also think that there is a psychological benefit that benefits my personal view, which is that I think it's re ridiculous, utterly ridiculous, that people start leaving at 945. And I'm ashamed <laughs> of the fact that people do that. Because we do. We stay. You know, Lots of committees stay. You know you've made this commitment. Now, of course, if you have a babysitter or a sick spouse, those things are all fine. But people who think, oh, we ought to be done by 10, I don't think we should give people the idea that, of course, we're going to be done at 10, no matter what. I think it should be very clear to people, because there will be times there are the most rare occasions when our timing is such that we would really need to decide whether or not to continue. And so I think it, is, it makes the most sense, as you just said, and Mr. Hayden affirmed, do it every time. And then again, the remind, and, and then it'll just become a matter of fact thing. And the moderator can also announce it you know, at the beginning of the thing that that's why we do that. You know, we start when we have a quorum and we end based on what the meeting says because the rule says 10 o'clock. And it gives them the choice rather than, Arguably, it could be misused by the chair. So I think it's great. And it is in the rules. There's, there's no way for the body to decide unless you give them the exactly. option. Exactly. Right. It's the only choice they have. So, okay. uh, Mr. Hayden, then Mr. Wolf. I might also observe that two uh, neighboring towns' town meeting <clears throat> went beyond 10 o'clock this year. Uh, there were some complaints about that, too. But uh, <laughs> they, they went, one of them went till after 11. Well, so, not well. unusual. Yeah. I mean, the 10 o'clock thing is in the bylaw and the handbook, and if members actually read it, they would know that, but uh, <laughs> is, this the, is this the time to discuss meeting time in general, or is that a separate question? Sure. Knock yourself I just know that I heard some people saying, I'm not sure exactly uh, you know, whether it was a proposal for concrete action or not, that, as Ms. Brewer said, part of the problem is that town meeting goes on because we start late and we, some people leave early. There's a danger, of, if not losing quorum, at least not having a fully representative body present, and 
one suggestion I heard was to change the town meeting meeting time a little bit, they say to start earlier, to have a longer session for fewer nights as opposed to uh, more sessions at the current length. I don't know if that's something we would be discussing or expressing opinions about. That was a suggestion I either made personally or made on behalf of the select board last time to them saying, what if we started at seven? So then they did a survey and the survey came out 50% each way. To, I'm not sure that many people participated in it, but, um, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of value in that. And so that's an interesting thing that I will call on you, I swear. Um, <laughs> the select well board. The time limit, though. Right. The, the keep select, it under 10 minutes. <laughs> the select board sets the time. So, you know, theoretically, we could start, you know, call town meeting for 4 o'clock in the afternoon if we wanted to. But it would obviously be a foolish thing to do without the, um, you know, TMCC is the perfect body to, to chew on that and think about it and make a recommendation on it. So um, if, uh, if anybody out there in TV land thinks it should start earlier than 730 I hope that they would get those comments to TMCC because I think that I think just starting at seven would make a big difference mm -hmm. Mr. Musini. I was going to in a much less eloquent way make the point points that you and Mr. Wald just made that um, this was a well relatively speaking I mean the budget uh, was relatively lacking in drama by design um, um, we had um, some very important zoning articles and historic district and some, you know, uh, uh, petition articles that merited uh, a lot of discussion. And it was a seven night annual town meeting, which is, you know, two more nights than last year, but probably close to the average, I suppose. Um, so the, so it goes both ends. Uh, is there a way to get the people's business done in fewer nights on average by attempting to start as close to seven as possible. Um, you're right, I don't think there's a huge participation rate in the survey and those who did participate, uh, there was about a 50-50 split. But I think that, to, and from my angle, continues to merit some discussion in terms of uh, uh, making it as user-friendly and family-friendly as possible to get the broadest possible participation in town meeting. Mr. Hayden and then Ms. Brewer. Just a personal observation about starting in the early hour, I, I sort of realized that the first two nights we had quorum very close to 7.30, mm -hmm. and the last three, we, or last, we didn't. It took a long time to get to quorum. That's even more but frustrating. So, so, so there's some support for an earlier time yep. for fewer meetings. Thank you. Ms. Brewer and then Mr. Wolf. Um One of the reasons I supported this, this is where I get to say I told you so, <laughs> but I supported this last year is because we knew we were going to be electing all new town meeting members. And by golly, TMCC could have done the outreach and said, you know what, it's going to start at 7. Be aware of that when you run for town meeting. I don't believe that typically TMCC has supported the idea of moving to 7, and that's why they're not championing it. But again, it's not up to them. And I think that we do need to make it 7 o'clock, and I think we just need to figure out some outreach associated with that. Because that is what it is. I just don't have an understanding of why we have to go with 7.30 because it just is too short a period of time each night because hopefully if we do 7, we get started by 7.15. It will make a huge difference. It's almost half an hour every night. So I just want to say that I don't think that TMCC, it, it's entirely possible they've taken no position whatsoever. They decided to put it to the body as opposed to making a recommendation to the body. They, they just asked the body. Um, if they uh, if they think about it and might want to make a recommendation one way or the other, then that could change things. But I think starting with by asking the body what it wants was not an unreasonable way to go about that. Mr. Wall. Just, just to follow up on what Ms. Brewer said too, you know, for the record and for the sake of the viewing audience or, or people new to this, that when we're talking about increasing the, decreasing the time and increasing the efficiency of a town meeting, we're not trying to short circuit the democratic process. It's a question of whether we sometimes take longer than we actually need to. Because one of the things that concerns me is that it's hard to recruit people to run for town meetings sometimes. And particularly, you know, if you, are, if you have a relatively flexible schedule or if you're retired, it may be easier than if you are young and have kids in school and have to pay for a babysitter and things like that. So I've always been a little bit concerned about the fact that the town meeting population, I haven't looked at it statistically, but it seems to be skewed more to the sort of, you know, 30, 40 and above and fewer people of the young parents with kids. And given that we vote about schools and property and things like that, there's, you know, there's a, a trade-off. But I think the more we can do to ensure that town meeting is as accessible in all senses to all members of the population, the better. 
Thank you. Um, and it's uh, a point that I make every year, but I like to make it, so I'll make it again. Uh, the folks on town meeting might sort of say, well, you know, we're here, we're here every night, doesn't matter how long it takes, and you can sort of get into that mindset. But we have to remember that there are other folks that are affected by the timing of this. So never mind the, the folks who have already opted in or out of participation based on how long it goes, but there are m members of different boards and committees who want to be there to speak to their article, but you have no idea. You need to, you need to um, pencil in every Monday and Wednesday in May and June to your calendar because you have no idea when something is going to come up. Um, folks who are, uh, who are abutters or who, who take an interest in the article but, but aren't town meeting members, experts that people want to bring in to speak to something, you have no idea whatsoever when, and let's just narrow it down to May because these days it doesn't typically go into June as much, but, uh, but it can and it used to and so you just never know. Um, it's really, it's pretty it's pretty stunning to expect somebody to be ready on the drop of a hat any Monday or Wednesday for three to nine weeks. <laughs> you know, it's so uh, so it really does have an impact. So whatever we can do to, to shorten it, I think uh, it, it's only beneficial. All right, I'm done with my town meeting comments. Did you want to talk more about this? I'm, I have a different or new ones. Okay, good. Different. Moving on to new ones. Um, and and I get before I do that very briefly. Um, I'm wondering if at this point you're feeling like you need to write a letter or if we're just asking Aaron to take this along to TMCC and then we're writing a letter just where we're going associated um, with the formality of there, this. There will be, uh, for the list tomorrow, I'll bullet point just a little bit of reference to each of these and I will send that to um, Ms. Streeter and Ms. Roberts from TMCC, right. which is Thank what you. I did last year. Too. Yeah, and, and I'll just right. make myself available to them to talking to flesh a little out. more flesh it out. <laughs> how exciting it was for us um, two things one is uh, in addition to the wonderful things you guys brought up um, is associated and this this is also a moderator uh, management issue that's up to him and I've seen him do it different ways over the last 10 years uh, 13 years and I don't think it worked very well this year and that's a so and I'd like to see TMCC so we all have a shared expectation at least TMCC understands it. the follow-up question the bane of our <clears throat> one of the banes of my existence at town meeting we have people who ask and say I have a two-part question it depends on what the answer is or I have two questions or whatever and it's never equally applied because it can't be once you start letting people do that thing. And it's really hard because there are times when, you know, you ask the question and they answer a certain way. And if you don't get the ask the next part, then you don't get the answer you want. But you know what? Too bad. Because it, it's just not evenly applied. So I just like TMC to talk to the moderator about that, about how what their perception is, because hopefully people talk to TMCC about that. Because I think that led itself also to this sort of political vein of things of, well, this person got to ask a follow-up question, well, but they got to ask a follow-up question, and then it feels unfair to people. And so I'm really worried about where we're trying to go with that because it's, it's a very uncomfortable position to be in. Hopefully you can ask it one way, but if you're going to expect that you're going to get to ask two-part questions, then we need to say mm -hmm. you can ask two-part questions, and that'll be fine. Not, it's not the end of the world, but there just has to be evenness about the way it's applied, and I think it puts the moderator in an awkward position to not, to not know which way he's supposed to go with it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is much more simple, which is about those cards. You know, my first initial thought was, wow, this is awesome. And then I was tracking who was showing up, because, you know, I had this thing about people running for town meeting and then never coming. And there were people who were coming who were forgetting to check in, because they didn't have to get cards anymore, and they forget about that and there were people who voted who weren't marked as present so we had the possibility we had three yeah we had three people because when I brought it up the other way I said, well we had three people who voted who weren't marked as present so obviously voter fraud could be an issue especially when we have zoning things that pass by three or five or not votes so I just like TMCC to talk about that and you know I still think it's a good idea and I, I don't think anything's perfect, but I think it's probably just a matter of reminding people. And that's why I asked Deborah. Deborah very helpfully put that up while we were in our meeting one night. Did you check in? <laughs> you don't have to get new cards, but you gotta check in. Um, because we don't want our votes questioned after when everybody works so hard. Okay, interesting, thank you. Ms. Stein. 
I don't see why we couldn't just vote by cards every time. That would get rid of this problem and there'd be a record of it and you could be sure that the right person voted and not somebody who is just sitting in the audience or um, it just seems to me it would get rid of this problem of people voting who shouldn't be or not having signed in. So anyway, just a thought. So, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so um, Mr. Wald and I were noticing a sort of a similar problem of that there were, you'd have people come late to the meeting who were there to talk about, who were there to, for an issue. They missed the whole thing at the beginning about the seats in the front are for town meeting members and the seats in the back are for non town So they just sit anywhere. And so, you know, you assume they're not voting, but they might be voting, you know, but obviously they're not voting <laughs> right. on tally votes, but for the voice votes or whatever. Right. So, yeah, it is very complicated. Okay, good, good thoughts here, Mr. Wald. I don't want to open up the whole can of worms about the zoning, but <laughs> the, you know, the thing that, that, that strikes me is it's, and I, I know this from having gone to some of the precinct meetings as well, that you know, it'd be, it, the, one of the key issues that arose here was how we can best discuss complicated issues because in some sense no one can understand everything about a financial issue or a zoning issue unless one is really immersed in the whole process, probably from much earlier on. So I don't want to get into that too much here, but that became an issue at this meeting when in discussing the first zoning amendment, uh, sorry, Freudian slip, the first zoning article, there was an amendment from the floor, and I'm not, there's so many variables involved, I'm not gonna to try to analyze the whole process, but suffice it to say that it was a very, it wasn't one of our high points, uh, it, I think through the discussion of the actual of the amendment, we had a long discussion about whether it was a legitimate amendment as well as about the specifics of it. That should not have been the case. It should have been clear at some point whether it was something we could be discussing or not. And so that took on a life of its own. It didn't help the discussion of the article in question. And I think also for a lot of new town meeting members, it was a very dispiriting thing. You know, on a just we're barely underway and you have this kind of total chaos. I don't know what we can do about that, but somehow if all parties are on the same page as to what constitutes an amendment, how it is brought forward, and so forth. I mean, if there's dispute, it should be answered promptly and not allowed to fester like that. Yeah, more good points, more, more tough to answer questions. Um, thank you for mentioning it, Ms. Stein and then Mr. Hayden. Um, there was that survey about hearing um, and I just want to say something has happened to this room. This is the first time that no matter where I stand in the room, I can hear everything. And I would give a lot if the middle school auditorium had that kind of acoustics. I don't know what they've done. They've done something, <laughs> but it's great. Um, and I know that I'm not the only one saying that it's hard to hear everything that people are saying hard to get the microphones adjusted. Um, I turn to you half, the, half a dozen times in a given meeting and say, what did he say? Um, and this is, I don't know what they've done here, but they've done something and it's fabulous. We do I wish a, it could be in the middle school as well. Wherever our technician is tonight, thank you very much. The, the sound quality in here is excellent and it's a matter of getting the, the mics and the, um, the speakers uh, Right. coordinated well and, and they really are just excellent tonight so thank you very much um okay yeah so still ongoing sound issues at the auditorium uh i think mr Hayden was so i wanted to back back up just a little bit um along the lines of of um complicated and difficult articles i want to um mention my appreciation for um the article 29 folks for working with us to even at the last minute, and that was a little bit difficult, sort of in the middle of town meeting to be, you know, thrashing through um, amendments to that article before it got to the floor so that it would work better. Um, the observation is that, I mean, folks who do that, even simply to go to Harrison, you know, the day before or even that night and say, I'm going to want to offer this, and they can get some quick hints as to how to do it correctly or more effectively. I'll use that word again, more effectively. Um, and on the sound, um, I, I won't make this in my report now on the TMTC, but there is a sound subcommittee meeting Monday, I believe, and 
Um, I have a lot to, to speak to them about. Um, I mean, I, I have a pretty good sense of, I don't know if you noticed that the sound was different this time than last time. It was actually better. Here? Uh, no, no. At, at, and at the, at the, yeah, here, of course, no, but in the middle school, because um, some things were done, some basic things, they can move on from that. So. Uh, let's see, Mr. Wall, did you have your hand raised? Anyone else on this issue, Ms. Burr? Audiovisual support. If oh, there's yeah. anything we can do, um, you know, sometimes PowerPoint just sticks, but um, if there's anything we can do, because people got real restless and cranky about that. And it may be that we just need to change people's expectations as to how different things will work, but it seemed like things were much less smooth this time around for nearly every article. And I don't know if it's people, you know, P TMCC's done a great job of saying, if you're gonna do a presentation, here's all the things you need to think about, and here's how the different pieces of equipment work. So I don't, I don't know what all the confusion was, and it may have just been a one-off kind of year, but it was an odd year for audiovisual. Yeah, I would, uh, another observation on that, a lot of people were trying new things this year. I mean, I saw some stuff that, I think I Maybe remember only Larry was, Kelly ever getting that close to that edge. more people were trying. Yeah, more people were trying, that so. It. But I do appreciate that TMCC put out all that info about how to try and make yep. it work. Small steps. Anything else? Town meeting. All right, I will do the best I can to synthesize this um, and put it in the list tomorrow. You'll see that if you th see that I left out anything glaring, let me know, and uh, then I will get the, that to uh, the TMCC folks. Okay, good. I appreciate having this conversation. I think it's uh, yeah, I think it's good. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> it's you know everything has to take as long as it needs to take, but it shouldn't <laughs> take any longer. That's my theory. Okay. Uh, so now we are at preparation for town manager evaluation and goal setting process. Uh, yes, it's summer again. Here we go. <laughs> All right. So you have in your packets a, uh, a timeline suggesting how we go about this. This is essentially the same timeline that we have used the last couple of years. Um, and it's, it's about fitting all the different pieces into our, uh, our meeting schedule. So we're meeting two fewer times this summer than we were last summer. The only thing that that changes is we're having one fewer goals discussion, which I don't think is a big deal because um, we're, now, we're now a few years into these goals that we just improve every year. And this board has been working together as a board for a couple of years. So we're not starting from scratch with that. So I, I think that'll work just fine. The other things are, you know, when the, uh, when the different things happen um, in relation to the town manager evaluations, when the uh, questionnaires go out to staff and the public, et cetera, and when they're all due back. Um, all of this is to culminate on that meeting on August 20th that will be just the evaluation meeting, same meeting we had last year where we sit around and read a bunch of documents and then we talk about them and what else should be included or excluded or whatever. Um, and so the other critical date I'll note on here is August 15th. That is the date um, by which I need the select board's evaluation forms to me. So everything kind of pivots off of those two end dates. Um, so uh, questions or comments about this now, we don't need to finalize it until the next meeting, but uh, is any particular concerns or, or issues about the timeline as presented? It really is the, essentially the same as last year. Everything is just that, um, the, the dates all changed by like two days or whatever to represent the, the change in calendar for this year, but every, it's the same three and a half weeks for, for staff to comment, et cetera. Uh, all right, so, uh, so if you come up with any concerns, then um, next week we will, we will look at that again. All right, so then moving on to the documents themselves. The first document um, in the packet is the stuff that we talked about last year after the evaluation, we tried to capture some comments. Um, the ones on the bottom of the sheet are from Ms. Brewer. She actually incorporated those into her, her review, so I wanted to, to pull those out so that they were in front of us. Um, and there were uh, a couple of thoughts that I had also. So we've, we've already, you've seen these before because we tried to have a discussion last fall about 
this, but but not going into them, but just to sort of inspire um, any new thoughts that folks had. So first of all, did it inspire any new thoughts about changes folks wanted to mention about the evaluation process from last year? Okay, if you come up with them, you can. Mr. Hayden, were you going to raise your hand? Well, I was going to. If we're talking about this thing here, yes. I mean, the, the first, the first comment about the fewer categories. I, that's that's good to have risen to the top. Okay. All right. Interesting. So, all right. Before we get into the specifics of these, is there anything else you want to add to this list before oh, we we talk about them? Okay. No. All right. So now talking about them. All right. So you want to consider fewer rating categories? It's something you'd like. Because I kind of went, yeah, it sounds good, but uh, nah. <laughs> Look at last year now. Uh, so, so we have five right now, um, and there is sort of little difference sometimes between, you know, what's great and what's excellent or, you know, whatever. Um, so we, it could get down to three potentially. Um, or you could just figure that you're just going to shift the line a little. You know, the line would be... You'd have the same problem. You'd just be of of which category it, it quite tips over into. You just have fewer categories to make that decision on. Uh, thoughts, Ms. Stein. I I would just drop commendable. Um, it seems to be outstanding, satisfactory, needs improvement, unsatisfactory, and unable to judge all address a particular um, point of view. But I don't really see much between commendable and outstanding. So there so. are definitions at the top of the page that is supposed to have us all thinking about it the same way. But um, I think outstanding is a performance surpassing reasonable <laughs> expectations. That's why I say they could be fused. Um, so I, that's, that would be my recommendation. Other thoughts about keeping or changing that, Mr. Walt? Was Mr. Hayden? Were you going no, to no, you go ahead. I'm still. I had a similar thought because I see some of the differences, but at the same time, I mean, I found myself agonizing over this. You know, he's doing a good job. Shouldn't I be giving him outstanding? But, you know, <laughs> I can't check A plus for every, you know, it's it sort of, it, it, too much, I think, could be read into what for the, you know, the, that is when the person is filling it out, we may agonize over which one to do. And it may be simply it's uh, a judgment call that then gets too much weight later on. So I, th I think if the work is excellent, the work is excellent. And I, much as I generally like data-driven things and numbers and quantification, I think that maybe the, you know, the pros comments here are the place to make those kind of distinctions. Okay. For me, so, that's more helpful because it's usually something specific. So you're arguing for fewer also? Correct. Okay. So I had said that we had five. We do have five if you don't count unable to judge. All right. So are we looking at four or three? Is unable to judge one of those? Uh, so unable to judge oh, is Do I get a follow-up question? <laughs> uh, yes, you do. Because <laughs> my question about uh, you know, unable to judge, to jump down to Ms. Brewer's point here, I think a lot of town staff put down unable to judge either because the town manager was new or because we were asking them things basically outside their field of, of daily endeavor. You know, so that's, that's maybe one drawback to having the exact same form for us and for town employees. That is, we see the town manager in a whole variety of contexts or we have access to information about that, whereas they may not. So uh, again, it may put them in an un uncomfortable position if they're saying they're not able to judge, and it may not help the town manager. It may, it may look more negative than it actually should be right. It's not. It's not a helpful category. I guess I found in a lot of cases. Okay. So let's let's um, to make sure we don't um, confuse too many things at once. Let's talk first about our form. So do we want to keep? Um, all right. We're going to step back one more time and Sorry. go back to. No, no, no. That's no problem. It's it's good to. You have to have all the information out there so you know how to um, focus. Um, so first on the positive stuff, so outstanding, commendable, satisfactory. Do we want to drop, uh, is there consensus to drop commendable? Mr. Wild said yes, Ms. Stein is saying yes. Sure. I'm almost wanting to swap outstanding for commendable. <laughs> if we have to lose one, I think commendable is a more positive, but I, it's. Sure. I mean, my I my, my observation is that you know there are there's three. I mean, we we are you know wow and okay and we got to talk. <laughs> yes. Now, now the the fourth the, there is a fourth category on our evaluation. It should be WW, not unable to uh, judge. Wasn't paying attention 
because these are all things that every Monday night we're considering and paying attention to. And if it should, we're we should never say unable. Issue, but okay. I, but then, then we should have three categories. All right, so, so before we go to three, first we're gonna go to four, right? So we're gonna, we wanna drop, um, we wanna drop one of them and uh, now we're hearing that maybe it should be, the, the top one should be commendable rather than outstanding. Do we have feelings about that? Well, outstanding is comparing it to something, and I don't know what we're comparing it to. Amherst is special. To satisfactory and commendable. So if we're going to drop the one that's the, the middle one of the good ones, what do we, so we all want to drop the middle one of the, of the good ones. Okay. So now what do we call the remaining good ones? One of them is satisfactory, and what's the other one? Wow. I'm not going to call it wow. Ms. Brewer. Nicely. I mean, one of the things that, that we could obviously talk about this for 12 hours just on this question, because one, we're not human resources professionals, which would cause me to think maybe mm. after we done having our discussion, we could ask that mm -hmm. one that was right there. Next um, year. <laughs> what, next year, okay, about what her thoughts are, because obviously she's been, and obviously we do occasionally ask the person who's actually being evaluated what he thinks the category should be, because um, you know we don't want him to write his whole own evaluation, but in terms of what's mm. useful. And, and what really is practical. I mean, arguably there are systems out there that are perfectly adequate to say satisfactory, needs improvement, unsatisfactory. You're done. And you know, maybe at the end you call out the five commendable things. You don't have to have the A++ category. I mean, whatever we do will be fine for us, but there is no one answer. And I know that one of the things we've always tried to avoid is the four point scale kind of thing. You know, well, the average is out to 2.7 on this particular item because it, it really, we know it's more subjective than that. But I want to come back to the unable to judge category as well. But I really, I mean, I could live with just having satisfactory and then calling things out. But otherwise, I think commendable sounds nice instead of outstanding. But I'm not married to any of them. So, all right. How about commendable is the highest one? High second. Okay. All right. So that's what we'll do. All right. Okay. Um, made a decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So now we're down to commendable, no satisfactory, satisfactory, needs improvement, unsatisfactory, and unable to judge. Okay. Before we get to unable to judge, any other thoughts about those remaining ones? Is needs improvement and unsatisfactory? Is that redundant? Are we splitting That's hairs? That's redundant now? in my mind. So are we looking at going to three instead of five? I wouldn't. Okay. <laughs> you wouldn't. It's my opinion. <laughs> okay. You like the four? I do. So, so the definitions are different. Um, performance below reasonable expectations with improvement likely yes. versus mm -hmm. performance below reasonable expectations with improvement unlikely. Sometimes that can be mm -hmm. <laughs> important. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Hayden. The, the, um, the, the thing that I'm wrestling with, and you know, I, I see this at work as well, is that you know, we're evaluating sort of a very high level professional a very high level professional function. And, um, you know, it's really hard, and I'm not sure if it's very useful to, to you know, to split it up into, into small categories. I mean, really, um, you know, we rely on, on the town manager for lots of stuff, and we're either going to be, you know, very happy with that, satisfied with it, or we're going to want, need, and I think if we're not satisfied with it, that requires us to take action. I mean, that's kind of what I see our job as being. I mean, there's not a, it's okay, you're doing badly. We're not gonna talk, no, no. It's unsatisfactory, you know, we need to, to, uh, to take action. Um, I, you know, just, just personally, <laughs> sort of, it feels a little bit backwards that, you know, I get to evaluate a real pro. I'm an amateur. Um, and you know, I sort of respect that responsibility at, at you know a very high level, and I you know lots of little categories doesn't help me with that at all. So. Okay, so you're pushing for three, for eliminating one of those and yeah. going to three. Okay, other thoughts about that? And call them what you will, but it, I mean, really, it's you know I'm impressed, and, or, and thank you very much, and we have to talk are the are the three actions that we're going to take 
or want to take in every one of these categories. So that was a kind of thought that I came out of last year's evaluation with also, especially when I was trying to turn them into the, the memo, the compilation memo. At the same time, the more I thought about it, kind of especially in the move up to this year, is that sense that um, that I was just trying to express, but express badly um, earlier. But but Mr. Wall talked about you know so you're you're going to uh, obsess over which category you're going to put it into. Well, if you've made them like higher stakes, kind of you, again you're just kind of moving the line. You're still going to obsess like well maybe I don't quite it's not quite needs improvement because that that's the worst category now. So you can't make it the worst category or something. So now everything ends up being in the middle because that's the you know, it, 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 you're always going to have that, that degree of nuance. You're just going to be able to spread it among fewer categories. But I think the obsessing is going to be the same. But, but who knows? We can, we can try it with three this year if that's what we want to do. And if that doesn't work, we'll go back to maybe 12 next year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so are we thinking three? Yeah. Are folks against it? So Ms. Stein is saying she, she likes four. I like four. I think we should stick with four for now. Four for now? Because I, I can think of specific situations where I wanted the difference between needs improvement and unsatisfactory okay. for the exact way you laid out the explanation here, with improvement likely and when it became clear that there was no improvement likely and that needed to be hmm. clear on the evaluation form rather than just, oh, that's too bad. It's like, no, that's real bad. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, okay, Mr. Wild, three versus four been back and forth on I mean I think that we do use the unsatisfactory as a rule very sparingly so it stands out by its nature and one could communicate that in the prose if we got rid of it but I think I'm persuaded that it's useful to have it there as a kind of a marker okay in other, in other words not choosing that helps to explain what needs improvement might mean in the context mm -hmm. okay so I think I think we're going with four this year so For we're now. good with four For okay now. small steps That's all right it. uh unable to judge so we're talking about the select board form first yes okay so not even talking about the whole complication this whole 360 thing and staff questionnaire thing is so complicated which hopefully also human resources can help us with someday because it's never worked it, it's worked better in our situation than it has in many others anyway unable to judge for us I, again is what do you <clears> read into it and I think we don't necessarily, I, I, I really think about Mr. Hayden's point where he said, well, I should have been paying attention or because I should know how I feel about one of these things. Although there are also some of the ways they've been written in the past, or maybe if a majority of people wanted something written on the evaluation as a goal, but you didn't necessarily agree with it, it might not be something that you feel like, I have no idea what he does in that area, and I don't care as opposed to, I have no idea, and that's a problem. So I don't know if unable to judge is being used as a category which says, I just don't have any dealings with that, nobody said anything to me, all I have is you know two comments out of thousands associated with this, which seem like one-off thing. So I really have nothing to say about this, or is it just that, and as opposed to just leaving the question blank, so it shows you actually answered it, rather than you forgot to put something in that space? Or is it that, you know, I'm unable to judge, and that's a problem for you, because I ought to be able to judge it. I mean, what, are, what message are we trying to send with it? What do we think we're accomplishing by having it on there? Okay, Ms. Stein. My thought is that the comments section allows us to amplify what we mean by unable to judge. So I don't really have a good sense to give an example here of how John interacts with people within a department. I really don't. I'd have to go by hearsay, in which case I would say that, um, or this is something that I really never get to observe or have ever heard about. Um, that's what I mean by unable to judge, and I can fill that in in the comment. But if you take that away, um, I'm sort of at a loss. So I would stick with it and use the comments section to explain what I meant. That makes sense. Mr. Hayden? Um, so, so, so I kind of want to maybe flip this argument on its head. Maybe there are two parts to this. Um, if 
we're unable to judge for whatever reason, you know, we never see, you know, something, um, um, then should we be evaluating it at all? I mean, basically what we put here is what we are taking responsibility to judge. Now, maybe there's a circumstance, um, for instance, if something doesn't get done or not presented to us on time, we can't judge on that. Okay, maybe, maybe that's a circumstance where, you know, we just aren't, can't, you know, I can't think of one of these that would fit that category. But otherwise, I'm not sure that we should put something down here that we're not going to pay attention to, make it our job to pay attention to. So here's what I would say about that. Um, part of what this form is, is asking all of us with a bunch of different questions that frankly we interpret the questions a little bit differently. We're trying to see what questions we need to be able to weigh in on and how we're going to answer them in order to collect enough information to turn into his review. None of these, he's not being specifically reviewed and you know his life is not dependent on, <laughs> on the, what any of us give as an answer to question number two or whatever, or question number 21. It's about collecting a whole bunch of information that creates a pattern of, you're doing great in these areas, you need improvement in these areas, select board, it really coalesces around these areas. So it's, it's using an imperfect tool to try and collect a bunch of nuance from us about him. Um, so I don't think we need to get too bogged down maybe in some of those things because we, we've had these conversations um, in, in past years also about the specific questions. We, um, this is a combination of, of a form that's sort of traditional that we've inherited and, and try to improve um, as well as sticking in our specific performance goals, which if, there's, if any of our performance goals came out unable to judge, that would be a real problem. Um, but these, these little questions in this inherited form are more about nuance and, and they're gonna mean different things to different people. And, and in the compilation that I do after, we, after you all turn in the forms to me, um, I'm trying to gather, you know, the fact that, all right, you know, that here's been this theme and, and some, somebody has, has addressed it under this section and somebody else has addressed it under this section, but it all is pointing to this greater thing. So I think that, um, I think that the compilation captures, tries to capture certainly all of that and that discussion that we have on the 20th is where we get down to, all right, this, this critical thing that I think was in there, somebody else didn't think to mention, we, we ought to get that included. It isn't so much about what each of us meant by unable to judge. All that does kind of come out in the, in the, the greater bunch of questions and the greater discussion. So I, I just put that out there for, as, for something for you to think about as opposed to um, maybe not just getting rid of it or keeping it. Mr. Wall. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, three things. I think I'm persuaded generally by the way you present it here. It's fine. You know, it's not, it's not a big issue. The other thing is two and three. I mean, if one really wants to worry about the details, I suppose one could include particularly uh, maybe on the staff sheet is not just ours, an explanation of what that means, you know, when it's appropriate to use that. The other thing you could do on ours, I don't know if that makes any difference, is just fiddling with minutiae, is to graphically to change it, to kick that unable to judge to the far right so that comments, you've got the other categories and then comments, and that sort of implies that unable to judge is something that you're not really going to be using very much. But that's, as I said, that's getting down to micromanaging the form. So you're saying it would be comments and then unable to judge as far as right. those columns? Just an idea off the top of my head, I don't know. That kind of separates it out as an oddity. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I like Ms. Stein's point about it you should be able to, you should still be commenting on why you're unable to right. judge. That kind of helps folks know. Do you think that changes it if you have it over to the right? And then it sort of seems like it's not one something that's being commented on. No, I think either way. I mean, I think the comments are important. That's so it becomes a comment almost if it's in the comment section. All right. So I think we're saying that we're going to keep unable to judge. Is that right? Okay. Okay. All right. So then moving on to other things about this form, and then we'll get to the staff form. So did anybody want to make any other changes to, 
And, and I would suggest that we really don't because we have done this a couple of times and it still comes down to the fact that, you know, there's one about staying informed about the latest technical stuff or whatever. Some of us think, uh, you know, we should get rid of that. And some of us think, no, no, that means, a, again, that, that's kind of all capturing the different things of, of how we are interpreting the questions and helps bring out whatever our answers are. Ms. Stein? I probably said this last year, but I still stumble on it when I read through the form. I really think that um, three should just, if you have seeks all possible revenue sources for the town, I would put in parenthesis C below, meaning go to four or C four, and just get rid of everything that's under there because it all comes up again in four. I just, I really see so much overlap between A, B, C, and D of number three and A, B, C, and D of number four. So I would just have a general comment for number three and then say for specific C number four. Because every time I read it, I feel like I'm hitting the same topics again. Yeah. Um. So it, we did say last year it would be nice if we could make the make the goals replace a lot of these as, as to the degree possible. Um, but for whatever reason, last year we wanted to still keep three. But I agree, there's complete overlap. So I would I would be in favor of getting rid of three. I don't think a general comment. I'm not sure what it would be that's not already covered by four. Do how do people feel about getting rid of three? Then, since that's a glaring one. Question three. I mean, you could this combine the language in, <laughs> in some way if you want to, but it do, it does seem redundant. So we could do that for next year's goal. We can't change the language of number four because that's the goal that we set already okay. from the memo. All right. It, none of this is uh, going to make or break anything, so we can try getting rid of it. If we miss it, we can put it back. Miss Brewer. Right. Exactly. And I think that we've we've worked really hard to try, like you say, to incorporate all the things that are important to all the people although some of them aren't as important to each of us as others. And we've also tried to balance that concept of annual expectations, which you've said right here, you know, but an FY12 goal. Because I think one of the things we're, we're, we were a little leery of is if the goals change substantially under a different select board, that then that whole concept would be gone from this piece of paper. But, you know, to some extent, we have to, I suppose, trust in the future kind of thing and really look at, in some ways, none of this should be on here except our goals, because those are our goals. Arguably, those would be the only things that would be on here as our goals, except then it seems like we, because it seems like some stuff's just boilerplate HR type stuff, and so it's like, why do we have to include that in our goals? Mm. But then it ends up on here anyway. So it is, it is awkward, there's just no question. But I think we can possibly now, at this point, feel like, oh, okay, now we are ready. We'll just take that off. We know that that's in the goal because the goals process has been laid out in so much different of a way than it used to be. Because having served on a different select board than several, than any of you served on, I can tell you that having five different people submit five completely different sets of goals and expect the manager to be evaluated on all sets, all sets is a very different experience than when we all agree that we're going to have to agree on what the goals are. And so it, it's just a different concept. And so I'm totally fine with doing that, and I also understand why we haven't done it yet. All right, so we're gonna get rid of three. Yes. Um, just a couple comments. Um, first, generally speaking, I am okay with the general thrust of where you're going on this and just uh, make the point, not for you, but for those listening, uh, watching, um, best practice in a, in a community with the town manager form is to have the select board collaborate with the manager on the setting of performance expectations. So that's not just a best practice in Amherst, it's part of my employment agreement is that, and so it, it's very, the structure and the uh, deliberation uh, and process related to my evaluation is, is most welcome from my uh, perspective. Um, so just real fast, uh, you know, getting rid of uh, outstanding versus commendable, fine, fine, fine. I agree there is a distinction between uh, needs improvement and unsatisfactory. Um, so I think that's all well and good. I do have a uh, belief that 
I think this combination of specific performance goals that may change year to year uh, continues to make a lot of sense, but I think there is a value in kind of the structure of the standard categories that are should survive you know most years if not every year so i think there is a value uh, to that in the tool um, so that's uh, on your form in terms of the employee form don't we'll get to that one okay yet. <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay because that, that yeah that's a that's a whole sure. one into itself um so you're saying you'd rather we keep three or no no, I agree. That, I agree with that one that it's redundant. But the basic, the larger point that um, the reason you're dropping three is because it's redundant with another goal on here. Okay. I'm saying don't just drop the standard ones. Right. Generally. Okay. That, that's my don't point. just do your goals for the year. Include right. some standard ones as right. well. Okay. So on Miss Brewer's points then from um, last year's comments, um, did you wanna did you wanna offer something else that should be that, that's redundant within the form? Why, yes, how strange that you should happen to mention that specifically. Um, plans, organizes, and ministers, which, which thing am I talking about? The uh, planning and anticipation of future, t I assume that I just don't have the number there because I thought the number might change because that's so unlike me. But um, yeah, that is on number nine currently under long range planning. Plans and organizes the process. That just, is so generic um, and we do have a lot of initiatives associated with future town needs and problems not the least of which of course is a building survey but we do have several others and so I think it was fine when we didn't have anything specific on the table but I think we do have specific goals now and so we don't need that one but okay you know. other thoughts about number nine whether that's we need to keep that or get rid of it we always have some kind of plan we're expecting I just didn't want people to try and think, well, what other plans, you know, other than the ones that are already laid out in our goals. All right, all right, I'm having trouble getting my document here. All right, so I'm sorry, plans and organizers, press one. All right, was that one that anybody felt strongly one way or the other about? Ms. Marisanti, do you have a reaction to that one? The description. In the absence of all those specific fiscal right. year goals, I think it would be important, but I agree it is redundant, mm -hmm. given that there were three specific long-range right. planning <laughs> goals. We stop asking you for long-range plans <laughs> specifically, we'll go back to generically. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna get rid of three and nine, and then what was the other one you mentioned the, there? The two, two, do the two separate expectations, those are numbers 15 and 17, and I guess I just, and maybe the town manager could weigh in on, what's the phrasing and what's the difference that he perceives between those things because you know obviously there's a whole bunch of different skills associated in there there's hiring the right people there's putting them as mr hockman used to say in the right seat on the bus there's not bothering to go out and look for people there's not bothering to look within i mean there's all kinds of things that you can read into those two things and it's hard to sort out what we're trying to get at except in the most surfacey kind of way which is of course we want him to get good people and put them in the right spots so again i'll just and you can have any response you want to it um but i'll just say that again it's trying to put out the questions that's going to get right. from us whatever it is that inspires us say oh yeah that that thing about how he deals with staff or whatever that it, um there, there could be nuance in one or the other that makes it worth keeping or not what do 15 and 17 mean to him 17 is more related to the recruitment of new personnel, I think, and 15 is related to how I'm mm -hmm. directing whatever staff we have under my authority. So can we just take off selects then? Because we already did so that. Is, that's yeah. the thing that makes that it make confusing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. 15 will dump select. Yeah. And then that it makes. All right. It's two separate things. Thank you. Any other drama that we want to do to this form for this year? <laughs> Is that enough? Quota for tweets, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so one of the ones I suggested, geez, this is going to go on forever, was uh, adding something about town meeting preparation, something oh, yeah. specific about that. Was that was right. Um, that, that definitely needs to be in here. It seems absent. So, all right. So, how about I just come Under up with some words for annual expectations. 
Yeah, it's, you can put it in for number three. Yeah, number three. All right, so I'll bring us new draft language for number three for next week. How about yeah. that? All right, I have a sense. question as long as we're doing this sure. and it's going on forever. Um, number 13, do we get information about that? I'm thinking about, I, I don't truthfully remember the goal, which makes life difficult. You must probably have it handy, but. Um, that is the goal. That, that's that the is full the goal as of written. The goal. Yep. I'm just trying to think what kind of information I've seen about the staffing plans. I've seen about the staffing plans for public works, but it wasn't here. All right, um, so I think that we can't get into how that okay. worked this year, that that okay. will be, we can right. talk about that as part of the goals and we can All talk right. about it as part of the review, but not as okay. part of this It part. was my only other comment okay. beyond the redundancy one. All right, so we're good with this form. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Then the staff form. Um, questionnaire. All right. So the staff questionnaire we've been using exactly the same for the last couple of years, except that we we've tweaked um, when we changed. It used to be the the uh, the <coughs> order of things: outstanding, commendable, blah blah. Started with unsatisfactory and worked its way up on both forms, so we changed them both. I think that's the only thing that's changed other than the dates since we started using this. Um, the unable to judge was something that Ms. Brewer mentioned and is also tied to one of my comments. Um, I would recommend that we drop the library employees from the distribution. I think that that accounted for a great deal of our unable to judge. It accounted for a great, now we can't know because we have no idea who what, what employee submits what, but, um, but every year that we've been doing this, there's been uh, a, a certain number of comments that come in and say, you know, that I, that person has never come to my department or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. that's clearly not the planning department or the finance department or whatever, you know, that's, that's like a branch library. And, uh, and so sometimes it's obvious. So um, this, this started when uh, a couple of years ago we started doing the staff questionnaire. We'd never asked staff anything before. Um, so when we asked for, from human resources, for, for all the staff lists who it should be distributed to, because they do payroll for the library, <coughs> they were on the list. Um, I think it should have been obvious to us before that that shouldn't be included, but live and learn. So um, I think that that will take care of a lot of what Ms. Brewer was talking about, uh, just as far as the staff part, not, not the select board right. part, which is an ongoing discussion, but, but the unable to judge for the staff ones, I think will decrease significantly if we get rid of the library folks who are not, of course, employees of the town manager. They do not report to him. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, other thoughts about the staff questionnaire? Okay, first let's, go, we'll just kind of be uh, organized about this. Do we want to make this match our form? Get no. rid of outstanding? Definitely. Okay. Get rid of outstanding. And yeah, so commendable will be the top. Um, and the, the, no other changes then, right? We didn't make any other changes to our form. Okay, so then other thoughts in general about this one? Mr. Wall. One thing that, that strikes me about it, this is, again, you know, looking at the first question, advocates for staff in dealings with the public. I don't know how town staff know what the town manager does, and maybe there's a press conference or a press release or a newspaper article. You know, elected officials, I guess, they could watch select board meetings the press, again, they can read the newspaper, but what, so, you know, I, I, I could see how somebody could in good conscience put down unable to judge there because it's not really a high priority. So I'm just, just looking at this now, I'm wondering whether uh, aside from the merits of that one, which obviously has some use overall, maybe even just a reorganization or a re slight rewording of the form might be effective. That is, when I see something that says, includes you or your supervisor in decision making, I can answer that, you know, because that's my experience, or keeps you informed, or treats you in a, you know, there's the kind of you question in which every employee can see him or herself on some level, and there are these kind of higher order questions to which not everyone may have access through personal experience. I don't know if that's, if that would also help to address part of the problem, either reordering or rewording. You know, because if you can see yourself in the in the question, then you can answer it. Right. Um, 
Uh, so Ms. Brewer had a good suggestion last year, which was to ask the staff, how do we make this form right. better to speak to you? Uh, absolutely. But last really year was time. not the time to do that <laughs> because right after we finished the evaluation, Mr. Musanti but was, I would, uh, had an issue this time. I, I agree with that completely, and I would include it as part of this form and not do a separate mm. thing. Just um, right. so, so they will have just gone through this and said, ah, I can't stand this because it doesn't really address the things I want to talk about. Right. Let's do it combined. Okay, good idea. Mr. Weld. Ms. Brewer was first. Oh, thank you. Um, because I think just um, because of a formatting thing, it fell off the bottom or wherever it was that they could turn it over to add comments um, because they have, and I know we've asked, given them space to do that before. We've said just right on the back if you have comments. Um, but associated with that, we could also say, you know, what's another, or what are some other questions, or we can phrase it however we want, but this, you're right, this would be exactly the time to do it is while they're filling it out, saying, nope, 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 that's not helpful. I do want to go back to question number one, though, because I absolutely, I, I, I don't care what order it's in, um, but we have to have that question because we've had town managers throw employees under the bus in the press, and that's not what we're, that's one of the things we wanted to avoid. So um, we wanted people to know that we expect the town manager to not do that. So I think their larger question is, do, do they know, or is that a question that we should be answering, <laughs> you know, that he's Maybe. advocating for staff to us? Um, all right. Um, all right, my brain is getting a little bit full of this right now. So uh, Mr. Wald is saying reword, reorder. Um, okay, if you don't mind, if you would all look a little bit more closely at this, think about it and bring questions okay. for next time um, and bring suggestions for next time. Um, is that the best way to do Can this? Can I ask a quick question about that? Yes. So one of the things that I, I think, again, it's the shared, you know, are we reading too much into the question? Is it okay to interpret however we interpret it? But in terms of the you questions, I think one of the things that, that we're dealing with here, for example, look at item four, treat staff in a professional manner. Are you asking, does he treat me in a professional manner? Or is it that although he doesn't bother me at all, I've seen how he acts around so-and-so and that's a problem. You know what I mean? And so I'm not, I'm not sure if we do turn them all into you questions or you, know, you personally mm -hmm. as opposed to leaving it kind of open to interpretation, which is where most of them are now. They're, you could answer it in any number of ways. I'm not sure. That's part of the rewarding. Thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree completely with Ms. Brewer. The first question is important, too. I just wasn't sure if that should be the lead-off question or yeah. how it should be worded. And then as far as the you questions went, um, I guess part of the idea was there, I, I just noticed that some stood out as being you questions and some were not. And Ms. Stein's suggestion about employee feedback on the form is excellent. I'm wondering if we couldn't even just add a column here saying, do you find this, you know, with the existing form, do you find this particular question useful? You know, as opposed to an abstract thing, what kind of things do you want? Have them rate the individual questions on the form. Just a thought. I don't know. Um, so this form goes out with a cover memo, and that's where the information about write it on the back or whatever I, I knew it was happened. Someplace. So I just didn't bother <laughs> to give you the cover memo this year. Um, but um, okay, all right. I'm just trying to think what's the best way to go forward with this. So you have because we, I, I would like for us to finish this next Monday because it needs to go out between our next two meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so bring, bring concrete suggestions and then you're just gonna have to trust me to do, to incorporate them as we, as we discuss them next week. And you won't see the final version of the form, you'll just approve it in, in concept, I think. How does that send sound? You stuff if, or we could send you stuff before next week. Sure. You could do it that way. You could say, if you don't have it turned in by Monday, let's try and only fine tune next Monday. But if you've got something you want to reword or something you want to throw away, tell you that ahead of time so that you can send us one that looks like that. Okay, that would Monday. be good. So that can go on our packet. All right, so anybody who has suggestions will send them to me by Thursday. Thursday? by Thursday noon or something so I can right. get this stuff done to get into the packet for Friday morning 
for a, for a new draft of this one. Okay. Easy for me to say. I'm just going to say, it's fine. Whatever you all want. <laughs> just to the staff form. Okay. And, um, and I will... I will bring the memo next time that will now incorporate the concept of, of uh, feedback on the form and, and to us about this. Okay, Mr. Musanti, anything you wanted to add about the staff questionnaire? No, I think you're on the right track. Um, and uh, I think continuing the form with continuous improvement to it uh, is good. And the whole concept of a you know, so-called 360 evaluation is, is helpful to me. And it will be really helpful, as someone mentioned already, um, Ms. Radway, to be able to talk with her about this. I only said next year, meaning because she won't have started until we're kind of in the middle of yes. this. Um, yes. But after we finish this, we can get her feedback about how it all went and how we can improve on it next year, which will be really valuable. And let me just step back a moment and say, we are light years ahead of a lot of different <laughs> of a lot yeah. of other towns as far as how this goes. I mean, we really we have this down to a science. We're we're trying to make perfect something that's really pretty darn good. Um, we do this on a predictable schedule. It's been working every year for a couple of years. I deal with other select board people from other towns, and we talk about these things and even goal setting. You know, pe people are dealing with with evaluations that aren't based on any goals and or and evaluations that are very informal and stuff. So I, I'm very proud of our process, very proud of what we've put together and and how it's advanced to this point. And it's, it's good that we're, uh, it's fantastic that we're still trying to tweak it. So, in fact, okay. we should be recommending to MMA that she be one of the people that they have for this session during our annual meeting, as we are amazing. Oh, we are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else we needed to talk about on this subject? I had said to Mr. Musanti as we were coming in, I'd like to try and get out of here while it's still light out. <laughs> oh, well, all right, thank you for talking well, I could, about uh, that. could move to, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, we're done with that discussion. Town manager's report. Thank you, and I said, oh yeah, no problem tonight. <laughs> uh, let me, let me uh, run through these hopefully quickly. Uh, Hadley Ambulance Contract, uh, which expires at the end of June. Uh, last Wednesday night, the Hadley Select Board uh, did approve to uh, a new three-year ambulance services contract uh, with the town of Amherst. I work with uh, Chief Nelson and uh, Hadley Town Administrator uh, David Nixon uh, and his uh, staff as needed. Uh, to get us where we need to be. Uh, very pleased with that. Uh, the, there's a modest increase in financial support each year, uh, which we agreed to quite easily. Uh, probably the biggest change is there's now a reference in the contract uh, f to the fact of Amherst uh, Dispatch providing uh, what's called emergency medical dispatch services. Uh, on Hadley calls as needed. Uh, and we've also worked out with our state 9-11 uh, folks, uh, modest increase in our annual grant uh, support for our communication center that takes that into account. So it was with their uh, support, active support at the state level and uh, another best practice having our professionally trained dispatchers uh, provide that through the various protocols, emergency medical uh, dispatch. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, uh, get up to speed on that. That locks all of our ambulance service agreements in place. The contracts with Leverett and Shootsbury have another year to run, and I'll be doing the same uh, drill with them over the coming year. Uh, next, War Memorial Pool status update. Uh, construction is uh, uh, happening uh, very actively. Uh, the uh, piping and the uh, liner and the deck work are really uh, uh, scheduled, weather permitting, uh, to be completed uh, this week. Uh, we are moving rapidly toward our planned uh, grand opening on Saturday, June 23rd, uh, where there'll be a celebration event 
Uh, we are still uh, uh, optimistic we will be done to uh, open the pool and uh, as scheduled. Uh, um, the weather being at this point, given the tight schedule to begin with, uh, the most unpredictable factor. Uh, my intention is to make a judgment call uh, by next Monday the 18th on uh, go, no go on our event. So I wanted to give the board a heads up on that. Um, and uh, I'll update you next Monday. Uh, next, a uh, quick update, town and school after school programming uh, implementation uh, on the heels of our town meeting uh, uh, support of, of, of my recommendation on additional funding in the town budget, uh, in the LSSC budget uh, for this program uh, with the town dollars replacing some CDBG funds that are no longer uh, allocated for this purpose along with some additional support and funding from our uh, school system. Uh, we are proceeding to have a uh, uh, more coordinated and uh, collaborative after school program at uh, each of our three elementary schools. Uh, we have uh, been meeting with uh, all of the providers. Uh, there were uh, in the most in the current school year five providers uh, offering programs at the three schools will have one uh, program at each of the three schools uh, in in starting up in the fall we are working collaboratively with the providers uh, the site coordinator positions have been posted and those applications are due uh, next week uh, there's also an out-of-school time coordinated position, which is a school-funded position, which is new, part-time. Uh, applications have been received. Those interviews are in the midst of being scheduled. Uh, I will be participating along with uh, the school superintendent and other staff in those interviews. And that's our key next step, is getting the leadership staff uh, in place uh, for each of those programs. and. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and in addition to a school and LSSC staff meeting with the providers, I've had uh, Finance Director Sandy Pooler uh, uh, scheduling and beginning to meet with each of the providers uh, and really get into the details about budget implementation and coordination with state uh, uh, funding agencies for things like the, the grant program that's being uh, uh, given to one of the programs, state vouchers, uh, uh, subsidy levels, all those kinds of things. So that's all happening. Uh, the key next step, though, is getting this, the key staff named, and then uh, that will really set us up for the remainder of the summer to do what's needed to uh, launch the program uh, at the beginning of school. Uh, next, uh, Civil War tablet restoration and display planning. Uh, you know from uh, 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 retired professor Bob Romer, uh, who's been actively researching uh, Amherst history and Amherst's uh, uh, involvement in the Civil War and the participation of Amherst uh, uh, base soldiers. Uh, um, we have, and the fact that uh, community preservation funds were allocated a few years ago now for the restoration of uh, six giant marble tablets that used to be uh, hung in this building uh, downstairs. Um, those, a portion of those funds have been expended. The tablets have been restored. Now the, the one really remaining question is the appropriate place to uh, display those tablets. Um, working with Mr. Wald, with staff, and with the Historic Commission, uh, there is now a consensus uh, that uh, the most appropriate place to display the tablets for the uh, benefit of the public uh, is in this room, uh, in the historic town hall, in the town room. Uh, we are now in the midst at staff level of engaging, of, of uh, issuing an RFP for uh, engineering 
architectural services, uh, because the tablets are so heavy, you want to make sure that it, to, for them to be displayed uh, appropriately in this room, uh, that all the v various structural uh, needs and design needs are, are appropriately uh, handled. Uh, there's also uh, a desire to have some interpretive uh, signage uh, accompany the display. Um, I'm also working with uh, Senator Rosenberg, who is a member of the Joint Legislative Commission on the Civil War Sesquicentennial Celebration. I probably have that title of the commission backwards, uh, but he's on the Sesquicentennial Celebration uh, Commission, and uh, we'll be looking at whether or not there might be opportunities for uh, some help uh, to assist us in getting getting uh, to the finish line on this, but I'm very, very excited about the project and appreciative of uh, the, the uh, participation we've had to, to bring us to a consensus on next steps. Um, recent and upcoming activity. Uh, I'm gonna mention quickly th uh, uh, four things. Um, a week ago Saturday I had, despite the, the steady rain, uh, I was able to, uh, along with a number of others, attend the uh, Human Rights Commission annual gathering uh, at Mill River uh, Pavilion uh, that included the presentation of some uh, Young Heroes Awards for uh, students in our school system uh, uh, doing doing good work uh, with their peers and their community on uh, so social justice and other issues. Um, last Friday, um, I attended the League of Women Voters uh, legisl annual legislative reception at the Women's Club. We were able to hear from Senator Rosenberg and Representative Story on action at the State House. Uh, and uh, this past Saturday, I, along with uh, a few hundred Others from the community had, uh, attended the Puffer's Pond uh, fundraising breakfast over at Mill River. Uh, and that was, uh, by the organizers' uh, feedback, a record turnout, able to raise some much needed funds, I think somewhere around 6,000 this year, uh, to support uh, uh, keeping Puffer's Pond uh, uh, the gem that it is. And lastly, uh, as you know, I'm the town's representative on the PVTA Advisory Board, and I'm serving currently as the chair. We are working toward a June 27th board meeting at which we will finalize the PVTA's budget for the coming year and also make some decisions about uh, what, if any, fare increases might be necessary to uh, maintain the uh, level of services at the PVTA. Um, the legislature is making its way through the budget process. Uh, I am informed that the uh, uh, there is now a uh, House vote and a Senate vote, or uh, some uh, um, agreement in the conference committee about some uh, one-time and some recurring monies that would uh, uh, go to the MBTA as well as all of the regional transit agencies, including PVTA, that uh, have the potential to cover most, if not all, of our gap uh, for the coming year. I've encouraged the PVTA and their budget planning uh, and the board to really look at this in a multi-year um, context, uh, particularly in the use of one-time money. The same conversations we have locally apply to regional transit agencies as well. Um, so, but we're making some serious progress and we're gonna try to do what we can at the board level to uh, minimize whatever, whatever fare increase is necessary. And I wanted the board and the Amherst community to be aware of those efforts. Thank you. Should people still be sending you feedback on that if, uh, about the fares? Uh, they can if they, they want to. You know, we're not gonna make any decisions until the 27th. I am meeting uh, with some members in the, in the local community uh, next week on this issue as well. Thank you.
questions or comments about any of the items Mr. Musanti talked about? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, then, we have member reports. And uh, Ms. Stein would like to talk a little bit about uh, some ZBA plans. Somehow I've gotten involved in working with the ZBA. I don't know how this happened, but um, <laughs> as you probably know, the select board um, is the appointing authority for the Zoning Board of Appeals. And um, I've had comments from any number of the Zoning Board people um, about the problems they have. There are seven members and Jonathan Tucker feels that you need a seven member board at the minimum to take care of all of the workload, although the workload is less than it was, uh, say, 20 years ago because more um, um, more projects are approved without special permits being needed. But anyway, at the current moment, we have three full members and four associate members. And the three full members are uh, one of the two options that are under Chapter 40A. The other option is a five-member board. Uh, associate members are variable and dependent on the community. Um, and we have four associate members. And what happens is that a panel, according to Chapter 40A, has to be made up of the full members unless one of the full members um, cannot sit because of absence, inability to act, conflict of interest, um, or a vacancy on the board. So the associate members um, spend a lot of time waiting to serve, and they have not been happy about that. And to, to give you a rough idea, um, associates during the past year about have served on about four panels, whereas the full members have served on about four times that many. So um, the question is, what would be better? And I would suggest that the current system is lopsided. There are too many associates to the number of fulls, so that for a, an associate to become a full member takes six to seven years. If each, per, if each full member gets to serve two, three-year terms, which is what the appointed committee handbook recommends, it even suggests that if it's a committee where special training is needed, which this is such a board, um, they could serve longer than two, three-year terms, which would make it even worse for the associates. So my um, um, tentative recommendation, and there is a um, meeting tomorrow of the entire zoning board, the, the full seven members, to discuss administrative related issues, and there is a posted agenda. Um, but my thought is that there would be less of this issue of the associates not getting enough time to serve if this was a five board, five member board. I did a little looking, as um, Stephanie notes, uh, there needs to be considerable research on this, and it isn't really my particular role to do this, but I did a little bit of looking, and I saw that East Ham has five members and two associates. Long Meadow has five members and three associates. And Sudbury has five members and four associates. So what it seems to suggest is that one could get a better balance, perhaps, between the five-member board uh, with the, uh, an appropriate member of associates. Um, there's another issue that might be better under a five-member board, and that is um, the fact that all members of the board for a three-member board have to agree on a decision. And that leads to a certain amount of pressure. 
uh, five-member board, a person could vote against a decision and the decision would still hold. So it's a little more democratic because somebody who felt very strongly about voting in the negative could do so. So um, tomorrow, I'm, Stephanie and I are both going to this administrative meeting and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I found out so far and um, they have discussed this in the past. They have some concerns. Um, my thought was maybe they'll have trouble uh, getting enough people, five people on any given date to, to have a committee meeting, to have a board meeting. Um, so I have no idea if that would be more difficult than it is right now with the three member board meeting but that's something they'll have to consider and research. I did not call any of these towns that have my member boards to see if that has in fact been the case. So that's all that I really want to say, except that's an issue that will be discussed tomorrow at the administrative meeting. And I'll just add to that, um, that that's just the beginning of the discussion. So, so getting uh, the ZBA's thoughts and reactions to the concept will be an important part of it. Obviously, it's not their decision to make. And in fact, it would require town meeting to make the change because it is part of our, uh, our, part of our bylaws that, that specifies how our ZBA is uh, comprised currently. Um, but it will be a, a process that also involves the new building commissioner uh, who can speak to some best practices and, and various uh, uh, possibilities for, for, you know, unforeseen for circumstances or, or, um, or uh, repercussions is what I'm looking for that, uh, that are maybe not obvious uh, on the face of it. So this is, this is the beginning of a discussion. I think it's worth right. looking at because it would solve some problems, um, but maybe it would cause others. We don't know that, but it is worth looking into and, uh, and uh, appreciate Ms. Stein's uh, dedication to, to looking into what might be better ways, kind of thinking outside the box about how ZBA works. So it should be a good conversation tomorrow night that will again, just kind of start off the process. Right. One of the reasons this has become more of an issue than it has been say four years ago is there was a much more casual approach to choosing which three people would serve on the board so it could have been two associates and a full without with the other um, fulls just not wanting to go that night. It, it didn't have to be that they really couldn't do it. They could just say, fine, let's let the associates have this, you know, get a, a more of an opportunity. And it was pointed out that that's strictly against the law. It has to really be um, a reason that the full can't make it. She or he cannot just decide to stay home um, to give the associate a, um, a chance. So that has made the discrepancy between the associates having a chance and the fulls um, forming the panels much more uh, delineated, much sharper than it had been before. So that was one thing I wanted to, to clarify. So you'll be hearing lots more about that as time goes on. Any comments folks want to add to that before it goes to her CBA's consideration tomorrow? Okay, that's the beginning. All right, uh, member reports, uh, others, liaison representative reports. I just wanna make one announcement on behalf of the Agricultural Commission. There are two vacancies. They would really like to have people with agricultural interests or um, farm related experiences uh, come to join the commission. Thank you. Other reports, Mr. Wald? For a change, I'll <laughs> give you something. Uh, Mr. Mizanti re uh, reported on most of the work involving the Historical Commission, and you heard about Local Historic District from Mr. Malloy, but I wanted to mention also that, uh, which we'll take up again at a future meeting, you know, Hope Church, which was one of the recipients of our CPA monies a couple of years ago, had some invited 
town staff and commission members to be a part of a photograph because they want to thank people who helped them to get money for the restoration of their building. They're almost finished now with the phase they're doing. The important thing, again, is that they were able to use the CPA grant to get a big state grant. So we want to encourage people as the season starts up at the end of the summer and the fall to think about the way that CPA funds can be used to leverage other monies because that's what we want to see happen. And of course, we were pleased to see, we didn't take an official position, but we were individually and collectively, I think, safe to say, pleased to see that North Church in North Amherst is being taken over by another church group, which means that there's a better chance the building stays more or less intact as it is. And again, we were happy that you recall that some years ago, for example, North Church was denied CPA funding by town meeting, and then Hope Church has gotten it. So I think we're past that precedent problem. So we want to uh, encourage people to learn from other examples. And I think the way that Hope Church worked with local uh, building experts and the town staff and the state to find funds to, pre funds to preserve the building was a good model. So we're happy to try to export that if we can. Uh, and then, and again, I mention that because we're sorry, Mr. Romer is speaking tonight at Hope Church about the history of the organization, but of course it coincides with the select board meeting, but their big celebration for the centennial is on the 24th. Uh, other business, I finally was able to attend a public arts commission meeting, <laughs> fit in my schedule because it's summer, and most of the time conversation that there was devoted to the upcoming biennial, which will open in early October. And they mentioned also that the bid, the business improvement district and conversations with the town manager had secured some funding, if I understand correctly, to help keep uh, the sculpture that's currently in Kendrick Park. Is that? Uh, that, that is in progress. In progress. Yes. Not a done deal yet, but. No, but it's, we're in progress. Conversations so. about that, yeah. right. So they're looking forward to the biennial and trying to think of new public art to put up and always looking for new venues and so forth. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from Mr. Wald? All right. Anyone else like to make liaison reports? Ms. Brewer. The Housing and Sheltering Committee did meet for the first time with its full membership, and oh, at, which was also the first time it ever met. Everybody came. And they are setting up, they're already in process of setting up their second meeting. They have lots to read and lots to think about. Some of them are very new to town government, some not so much. So it's very, it's going to be a really interesting process. But Nate Malloy is, again, the uh, staff liaison for them and will be bringing them along. But lots, lots of different things for them to work on. Fantastic. Thank you. Others, Mr. Hayden. Yeah, just uh, you, you know, heard from about the TMCC working on the sound and everything else. Um, the Recycling and Refuse Management Committee are going to be at the Taste of Amherst um, recycling refuse. So there's, uh, I guess the the vendors are all using um, recyclable or compostable uh, utensils and plates, and the RMC are going to be looking after that. Perfect. Thank you. Other liaison reports. I don't think I have any or I'd forget them all. So, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so the chair's report, I won't take up all your time with that because instead I gave it to you as a memo um, because we haven't been talking about these things for a couple months. Um, so in particular, I just called out the things that I wanted you to, to be aware that, um, you know, sometimes I do things that I'm actually kind of bringing our views to other people and kind of really representing us that way as opposed to just kind of making nice remarks somewhere or whatever. I'm really kind of representing us. Other times I am being kind of the eyes and ears for the select board. Um, so, uh, so I'll call your attention to the public safety tabletop information there that uh, that's uh, I've got as bulleted on this memo um, it was very interesting this memo is on the website if folks want to read it um, if any of you have more questions about that either tonight or in the future I'm happy to answer them um, the U UMass Police Department accreditation meeting very interesting I was, I was glad to have the select board be asked to be part of that I've got some information there also the kickoff meeting with uh, new bid director Alex Krograbe um, looking for kind of the select board perspective on things and uh, the first meeting with the new student government association president so I want to particularly call your attention to those things but you do have the memo so you can read it um, any questions or comments about any of that Okay, um, I think we've done all of our untimed items. I do want to mention a couple things coming up. Um, next Monday, we're gonna have a public hearing on the new liquor license application for Hess Express. This is um, the gas station in South Amherst, so that will be next Monday. Um, 
also next Monday, it is not noted on here, uh, we're going to vote on the thing that we talk about on Wednesday. On Wednesday of this week, the 13th, is that meeting, the public hearing for the retired teacher's health insurance. This is going to be a joint public hearing of Amherst Select Board, Pelham Select Board, and Regional School Committee, and this will be in the middle school auditorium. We will be hearing from retired teachers. We'll be hearing the recommendations of the insurance advisory group and, uh, and the town manager and superintendent. Um, and then it will be at next week's meeting that we will take the vote on that. Um, so those are the key things that are coming up now. Um, we don't meet again until July 16th, <laughs> unless we have to have, uh, p potentially we could have another public hearing for a liquor license, like a big meeting, not just one of these special liquor licenses. Um, once a liquor license application comes in, we have a certain window of time in which we need to act on it, so it, it's hard to predict that. <coughs> but uh, but if, if something needed to be scheduled before the 16th, then we would need to do that. Um, Otherwise, the calendar stuff is all pretty clear. Mr. Musanti is speaking at the chamber breakfast on Friday morning in the Taste Tent uh, on the Common. That's at 7.15. It typically rains, but I don't think that there's rain in the forecast <laughs> this year, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, and I think that those are all of the things that I wanted to mention. Is there anything else anyone wants to mention, Ms. Stein? What about that bottle bill? Um, oh, yeah, that's tomorrow. So there's going to be an event at Kendrick Park at noon. Uh, I'll be attending. Mr. Musanti will be attending. Anyone else is welcome to attend. Uh, so they'll, this is 12 the at noon at Kendrick Park. Park. This is the UMass Mass Per Group looking to try and uh, bring more attention to, put a little bit more pressure on the updated bottle bill before this legislative session ends at the State House. Anything else? Mr. Hayden. I move to adjourn. Without objection, this meeting adjourns at 926. Thank you very much.